because of the fact that we're going to cause the, the apocalypse, they've, they've brought them here. It says, to be judged by a jury of all the people who will never be born because of you, which I think technically is the new abortion policy in Texas. I think that's what we just brought in. <laughs> oh, I was like, okay, please, please be a jury of fetuses that they do, right, in like yeah. little crang suits or something that they get tried yeah, by. Yeah, they- <laughs> I felt I, I just wrote my notes like that doesn't feel like a very impartial jury at all. I feel like the deck is stacked here. God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because by some weird technicality, that's a job. I'm your host, No Illusions, and sitting 700 miles to my immediate left is my good friend Heath Enright. Heath, welcome back. Thanks, Noah. Very excited. We got a old-timey moving picture today. Very excited. We, we do. We add that, we do. And unfortunately, we're going to be without Eli again this week, but in his stead, we're happy to welcome back host of Be Reasonable, co-host of Skeptics with a K, project director for the Good Thinking Society, and self-proclaimed skeptic of the year for several years and running, Michael Marshall Marsh. Welcome back. Hey, thanks. W- lovely to be here, guys. Always great, as I say, to be on this show. Although I do feel like you've you've got through the introduction a little quicker than you needed to. I think what we'll learn today is that introduction should take a really, really long time before <laughs> anything happens. You should have just meandered around by yourself, and then, like, in about ten minutes, introduce Heath. You know, slowly yeah, ease no, right. the listener in Heath, to what's happening. Can we add to the margins of this intro somehow? <laughs> <laughs> So what we need is this intro needs to be in a bigger font. That would help. (laughs) So tell us, Heath, what will we be breaking down today? We watched The Flight That Disappeared. It's the story of God taking an ethical stance about nuclear weapons in the world in 1961. (laughs) A little late to the party. (laughs) Well, it's eventually a story. Eventually, it's a story about that. It takes its fucking time. Mm. And Marsh. I think technically it's 1962 before that bit happens. Right, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Literally the year of the Cuban Missile Crisis. (laughs) And Marsh, how bad was this movie? Well, if you love to watch black and white interventions by mystical forces showing the impact a single life can have on society, but for some reason you need to see that set at 30,000 feet, mm-hmm. you will mm-hmm. love this movie. <laughs> it's, it's essentially, it's a wonderful flight. That's what this film is. <laughs> it is. Yeah, let me, let me just say, as a person who loves old black and white movies, I can really see why most people don't now. Like after watching this, I get it. I, I understand it. So is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best to be the worst at? Ooh, I would. And speaking of, you know, old black and white movies, the time of airplanes in 1961. Best, right. best airplanes. The traveling in airplanes in 1961 looked amazing. Oh, yeah. Everybody's having a great time. They're taking bong hits together. They're on like... <laughs> Eames <laughs> chairs with ottomans. Yeah. There's a fucking bar lounge in the back yeah, of the bar. Like 40% of the plane appears to be a bar. It's incredible. It's like 14 people on the whole plane. It looks delightful. Yeah. It does. <laughs> it does. Even with all the damn cigarettes being smoked on it. Yeah. No, but so, and, and that's honestly, that's where a lot of the doldrums of this movie come from, right? Is because in 1961, I guess there was a certain amount of your airplane movie that you could fill with like, huh? On an airplane, it's probably like this, <laughs> right? <laughs> So I'm going to go with best, worst, big idea. So one of the characters in this movie, in the first act, we established that he has a big idea that the scientists won't take seriously. And they build it up to the point where you're getting kind of excited to hear what this big idea is. And then we get the reveal in act two. And uh, well, and it's a best worst is all I'm going to say about it right now. Oh, you're talking about Walter's big yes, idea? Yes, this, exactly. is yeah, this is Walter. It makes no sense. We'll get to it. We'll get no, to no, it. It's, it's incredible. Bananas. And it's it's mine is quite similar. It's the best worst tension resolution for this because we <laughs> ramp up tension in this film and it takes a long time to get to where we're going. And then as we're at the stakes, you know, we have a whole thing of like, you know, we're going to have to kill you for what you're about to do. Unless we don't, actually, we just don't. And they well, decide actually, not to. You know what? That, another guy. <laughs> you know, like, you're going to destroy the character. entire world unless you throw away a single piece of paper and then it's fine. It's like they just puncture the tension in the most disappointing <laughs> ways. <laughs> <laughs> Movie. Yeah, right, right. All right, well, I'll tell you what, we've got a lot of vamping to do on the other side of this break, so we're going to take a minute to warm up. We'll be back in a flash with all the procedural doldrums of The Flight That Disappeared. Oh, hey, Heath, uh, what's with the ice? Have you hurt yourself? 
No, no, just uh, icing down after my workout. Oh, your workout? Yeah, yeah, my workout. I decided to get a little more active this year, you know, not getting any younger, right? So I decided to go and play a little hockey at the community rink. So wait, your idea in how to get in shape in your 40s was to play a full contact sport that takes place on a sheet of ice. On a sheet of ice, yes, yes. Heath, if you want to get in shape, why not just try FitBot? Oh, what's FitBot? FitBot is an app that creates custom workouts based on your personal goals, experiences, available equipment, and more. And the workouts improve as you improve so it can keep you challenged and keep your workouts effective over time. I don't know. Because with hockey, I get to buy an absurdly expensive bunch of padding and equipment. It's so ungainly, it barely fits in my trunk. I, I love all of that. Does FitBot have that? No, it doesn't. It works with what you have and tailors a personalized workout so you can keep your workouts going even when you travel. I've been using FitBud for a while now, and as you know, I can damn near box jump as high as I could in my 20s. Almost. So close. You're so, so close. close. So wherever you are in your fitness journey, get the most out of every workout with FitBot. And right now you can get 20% off your subscription at FitBot.me slash GAM. That's F-I-T-B-O-D dot M-E slash GAM. Wow, that is a great deal. It sure is. So you think maybe you'll try FitBot instead of, you know, challenging 26-year-olds to pick up hockey games? Yeah, it's been three weeks. I'm starting to think the ice isn't helping. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe we'll do FitBot. All right, guys. Welcome to the Writer's Room meeting for our next Metro Goldwyn Mayer production. Great to be here. We're all smoking cigarettes. We are. So what kind of movie are we making, boss? Well, it's not a whitewashed, banal glorification of suburban family life, and it's not an overly sexualized drama that only manages to get distribution with a biblical tie-in, and it's 1961, so that only leaves one other kind of movie, doesn't it? Heavy-handed metaphor about the dangers of nuclear weapons. Of nuclear weapons, exactly. So who has a plot for me? Uh, yeah, yeah, I got one. So, okay, uh, there's a plane, right? And uh, it's, uh, it's on a flight, the airplane. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, so that... Okay, honestly, that's as far as I got. I feel that's, that's probably far enough. That's probably Wait, far enough. I think it's good. I, no. Guys, no, no, that'll get us through the first 43 minutes, sure. But what's what's going to carry us over the finish line here? Mm. Yeah, all right. All right. So uh, what if the plane, what if it got like... Uh, uh, hmm. uh, abducted by aliens. Teleported to the future. Oh, well, I was going to say sucked up to heaven, but I, I feel like we can make all three work, right? Hey, you know what I always say? With enough ambiguity, anything can be a plot. Oh, and uh, maybe we could be more progressive since it's 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 just barely not the 50s anymore. Uh, what do you have in mind? How about maybe the mathematician could be a lady? A dame who knows numbers? You know what? It's so crazy. It just might work. I don't know. Can the male characters still refer to her as honey, sweetheart, and dear? Oh, exclusively. All right, then I'm on board. Bully, this is going to be a great movie. We still have lead in all our paint. <laughs> and we're back for the breakdown and we're going to open up on some aggressively generic black and white movie credits jesus <laughs> yeah and some uh interesting music it sounded like like bugs bunny took acid maybe but he's sure. not sure and it was going to be like a fun episode of the looney tunes yeah it was not they got a theremin for this music and they were getting their goddamn money's worth out of it yeah <laughs> Yeah, I was pretty sure from just the music alone, this is going to be Aliens. This is a very Aliens music. Yeah. And I don't think any film has ever spoiled like the twist, as it were, or spoiled the plot that soon into the film. Like Even just the music cue alone. <laughs> yeah, right. like, oh, that's what happens. Okay, that's yep. fine. Yeah, they're like, oh, this is Haunted <laughs> Alien music. I bet this is a Haunted <laughs> Alien movie. This is a bad Christian movie. Yeah, it's all spoiled now. Yep. <laughs> so, okay. So we open at the LA International Airport. We know this because the... <laughs> Like a camera points at a sign that says LA International <laughs> Airport. They were still learning their way. They were feeling their way in 1961. Yeah. We also know it's 1961 immediately because the announcer, apparently over a PA that's being projected like out onto the tarmac, yeah. is like, mm -hmm. everyone, you know, in your tuxedos and ball gowns that's out there <laughs> on the tarmac, you can uh, board now. Grab your martinis. You can take it right on board. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Yeah, if you got a bomb, give it to the valet. They'll uh, check it. <laughs> it's it's so crazy. They were all just milling around out there having a party. Yeah, yeah, it's so weird. Could you just do that? Could you just like hang around on the runway of the airport just before you go? Like, because they do the boarding call, 
but that just means to board, to actually walk onto the plane, like last call to step onto the plane, not for any other kind of check or anything. I've, I had no idea that's how that used to work. It seems wild to me. <laughs> I, honestly, given how aggressively people push towards the jetway when it's like still two numbers away from their number, I get it, right? Like I understand. <laughs> yeah, that, I like that. But this, yeah, this was before the days of those fancy jetways and shit. Yeah. I think we should go back to this because I hate the people that do that. I feel like it should be like at the beginning of a, a boating race, there's like an area where all the boats have to like mill around and like try to time <laughs> their start just right. But you have to keep moving. And it's like a strategy thing. Oh, all right. All right. I like yeah. that. Yeah, there you go. So, OK, so we're going to watch everybody get on their uh, on the plane. This was back when you wore like a fancy suit and tie to I, either you got dressed up to go on a plane or that's just how everyone dressed everywhere all the fucking time. I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> We spend a lot of time on the admin of the seating plan. Apparently, that was a really important thing for us to, as the viewers, to fully understand about this. And I wonder if that's because, as you say, just showing a plane was like, interesting enough. Maybe this film was like part sponsored by an airline as a way of sort of educating people on what the process of getting on board a plane is. Like, oh, there you, go. Like, you know how you, you see the safety demonstration videos? It's like they've just tried to incorporate that into this movie. Oh, interesting. Well, right, because clearly in 1961, people had a lot of fucking trouble finding 10A all by their goddamn selves. He needed right. directions to get to seat 10. To seat 10. I mean, I assume there was numbers, but even there wasn't. You can just count. You can see all of the seats. Or sure. just look for the only space that is likely to be in row 10 because <laughs> everyone else is sat down. That would be reasonable. But the numbering system where the seat that he gets into is That's in true. fact row 10 is insane. Yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> there are maybe 10 rows, but he's not in the 10th one from any direction. No, they're, he's no, not. He's not they're counting all. from the outside in or from the inside. Out. Yeah, I had no idea. No, you're you're correct on that. But yeah, and we watched that several times, right? We first we watched this guy who I had down as angry birthday magician. He's going to turn out to be a scientist. <laughs> he's he's Oppenheimer, I guess. Yeah, yeah. He's he's Carl Morris, mm -hmm. but the flight attendant who says his name as he walks on said like Karl Marx and I heard Karl Marx and I was like, oh, okay, okay, he's evil because he's got a goatee and they hate, they hate socialism. <laughs> so that's yeah. what they're going to go with. No, but yeah, no, he's like. the uh, Oppenheimer character we're going to learn in a second. Yeah, we'll find out that he's Karl Morris, the Karl Morris, Dr. Karl Morris, the Karl Morris, Karl Morris, because everyone seems to know who this fucking person is. Karl like, fucking Morris? <laughs> they get excited. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> So, and he gets on the plane and he's like, oh, and oh, by the way, is Marsha sitting next to me? And the lady's like, uh, the flight attendant's like, no, uh, we can arrange that. And he's like, but don't though. I thought that was his wife. <laughs> yes. Yeah, which is, way, it's way funnier if it's his wife. It turns out that it's his coworker. But. <laughs> she also, she asked to see his ticket, but she doesn't like actually look at it or read it. So I just needed to know that he had something ticket shaped. And that was yes. apparently <laughs> enough of a security check right. to get on the plane. <laughs> I mean, nobody would choose to sit in 10A, you know, I, <laughs> I guess. Also, it is, it is, seems very strange to me. And it, we will find out why this is. But it's at this point, it seems strange to me that as people getting on the plane, everybody turned left to fill the entire plane. But there was clearly another half of the plane that wasn't seats. And I was like, what is going on with this, this geometric oddity of a plane? <laughs> and we will find out it's because half of the plane is dedicated to a lounge bar. We learn it's, it's a discotheque on yeah, the other half Yeah, there's basically the like an old-timey pianist there on a grand piano. <laughs> there's a singer. There's a jazz band going on. Yeah. <laughs> beanbag chairs strewn about. There's a hookah <laughs> in the middle. It's a lot. Yeah, no, but it's completely reserved for named characters, interestingly enough, which is, which is <laughs> a, a weird one to explain on the ticket. But yeah, and then, so we, we watched Dr. Carl Morris get on the plane. Then we watched Tom get on the plane. Tom is a dashing young man who is being seated next to a stunning young woman, right? This is uh, Marsha. Mm. So they sit down. They're going to be major characters. We, we established that. And then the pilot shows up after all the passengers are seated, which seems totally inefficient to me, right? Yeah, he just shows up like at the door of the plane, to be clear. It's not like he shows up on camera. He walks up the stairs to get on the plane after everyone else. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, sorry. And he just like throws martini. a martini glass yeah. behind him. It crashes. <laughs> and he walks in. All right, let's fucking fly this shit. 1961. This is legal. All right. Where am I going? <laughs> also, I have a question. <laughs> Are there normally three pilots on airplanes or was that like an old timey thing? I think there's a... Because they have three. Yes. Yeah. I think the other guy's the navigator. I would say he's the navigator. I think, yeah. Oh, yeah. the guy who maps out the plane's flight path. Yeah, that's that's the guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So so he gets it to the cockpit and there's the co-pilot, the navigator. And we have to establish, first of all, 
Hank's got jokes. Hank is the pilot, right? He's, he, he comes in. He's got, he's got material. He's got his Type 5. But also, we need to establish that this is a propeller plane, and we're right on the cusp of them moving to jet planes. They're going to spend so much time on that point that it's just going to baffle you tonight as you go to sleep why <laughs> the fuck it never factors into the movie in any meaningful way, right? No, because there is a moment where it could factor in because they're like, oh, at this altitude, only a jet engine could work. But then they go above that altitude and a jet engine wouldn't work there. So they just didn't yeah. need to include that at all. They just didn't, did not need to reference it. No. Nope. has nothing to do with anything. Speaking of which, the co-pilot at this point goes, I'm going to get married soon as my personality. And everybody's like, it sure <laughs> is, man. And Hank's like, ladies be ladies. Lady, right? Right? Here's my tight five. I'm going to say right for the next four hours <laughs> the whole flight. <laughs> There's a great bit where he goes, you know, shall we have a go, chaps? And I wrote my notes. Hey, Marsh, that was him doing a British accent. I can see how you might not have noticed on your own. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So the, so the plane takes off. We watch this pilot, this poor guy. He's kind of randomly deciding which levers to push for plane takes off. Surprisingly little conviction. Right. He's like the guy in Captain Phillips who tra takes over the ship and starts pushing buttons to see which one makes it go. He kind of <laughs> does that for a minute. And then we see the fucking no smoking light turn off on the airplane. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I don't know why, again, they needed to fix on that. And I think this is because this is the advert for the airplane. This is an advert for the plane line. It's like, yeah, once we're in the air, you can smoke to your heart's content. Don't worry about that, guys. <laughs> Come on, we'll sort you right out. We can hook you up with some stuff. Do you want, do you want weeds? Do you want uh, dope? We can get you some stuff as well. This, we, we've got a guy up here. But well, we are responsible about it. There's no smoking, you know, right at the beginning while people are, you know, deconstructing their elaborate formal wear and <laughs> taking it apart because it's all like 12 to 13 pieces of clothing each. Right. Yeah. But then you can smoke. Back in the day, international waters also like it, it, the, the borders of international waters started above a certain altitude as right. well. So yeah, after no, that, exactly. was legal. <laughs> yeah. International fluid. <laughs> So yeah, so and and we meet Joan. She's one of the flight attendants. I never caught the other one's name. She is the fiance of the co-pilot, though, right? I don't think I ever got her name. Yeah, I don't think she needs a name because she's going to be married soon. So look, she's not going to use that. Yeah, I don't think she ever got her name either. Right. So. Well, that no, that's true. She's Mrs. Jack co-pilot. Yeah. yeah. So and well, speaking of which, so this is where Joan gets on the microphone and she's like. We really couldn't think of a way to emphasize the names of all the various characters. So I'm just going to say them. The pilot is Hank. The co-pilot is Jack. I'm Joan. <laughs> yeah. And two ladies. One of the Allison Bechdel. Yes. You know, <laughs> one of the <laughs> and the thing is, she basically gives the full resume of the flight crew at this point. She talks for so mm -hmm. long. And I thought, why are we watching this? I don't even pay attention to this. But when, when they do it, when I'm on a flight and they tell me all this stuff, right, I don't yes. pay attention. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And then it, as I'm writing the bit about like, wow, are they shoehorning in these characters' names? We see Tom turn to Marsha and say, hi, I'm Tom. And she says, I'm Marsha. And I'm like, oh, come on. <laughs> I did like the lack of any kind of safety briefing. I wanted to kind of, and in the event of an engine failure, emergency cigarettes will descend from the roof. <laughs> <laughs> so They should have that. Yeah, honestly, like if ever there's smoke them if you got them, right? like yeah, at that right. point, yeah. come on, yeah, yeah uh -huh. that's fair, and you got them. <laughs> well, so, but we meet Tom now. Marsha recognizes his name. His his name is Tom Endicott. She goes, "I've heard those syllables before." Endicott, are you in business? <laughs> that's that's an exact quote. <laughs> what? And he's like, "Yes, I'm in the commerces." Sure am. What does that mean? I truck barter exchange from time to time. I dabble. <laughs> <laughs> but he explains that he's a lobbyist headed to D.C. to talk to important politicians about very important things. And so she lights a cigarette on an airplane. I just it's so fucking weird. It's <laughs> it's so hard to get my head around. Also, she appears to be wearing a string of pearls around her neck, but they seem to be like open at one end. Like it's like it's late night at the fancy event and the guys are wearing their ball ties <laughs> undone. Like she's done that with her, her pearls. That's classy. Like Tony Bennett, right? Yeah. yeah. It, it looks great. It works slightly less well when it's a, a pearl necklace, a string of pearls. <laughs> yeah. So they talk about him for a minute and then he's like, okay, uh, lady person, what about you? And she's like, I'm Marsha Cut. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's yes. over. Instant cut. It's incredible. <laughs> Let's we hear about you, Marsha. We don't care. Cut away. About you. <laughs> So, yeah, so then Joan goes through and checks on every sixth passenger. 
<laughs> and this is not the last time that we will watch one of these flight attendants go all the way down the aisle. Right. Like like we could have just had her go like, can I get you anything? How about you? OK, we get it. She's making her checks. No, all the way down the fucking plane. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is uh, as well as where we see the pilot start to radio into the tower. Oh, yeah. And I think what he says is trans go 60 over Bryce at 570 20 mm, IFR estimate Denver. I thought, yeah, don't let the actors ad lib lines when they're suffering from aphasia. It just does not come out. With <laughs> you okay? You smell toast, buddy? This is why we have three of us. <laughs> so, yeah, so we, we check in on the flight attendants. This is where we learn that the other one is getting, I, I just, I have her as fiance stewardess. She's the most sexist fucking name I've ever given a character in my notes before. <laughs> But they have a conversation, her and Joan, about how Joan doesn't want to get no husband, darn it. And then the fiance brings coffee to the cockpit. Right. In open mugs, like just regular coffee mugs. Yeah. Guys, there's like an instrument panel right there. There's just hot coffee flying all over the place. <laughs> get lit. Get to go cups with lit. Don't put it in martini glasses. It's insane. <laughs> And this is, so we, we established that, as you say, so the co-pilot is getting married to one of the flight attendants. We found out that the pilot is the best man. And I thought yeah. this all seems very small and insular and like incestuous. And like, we're going to, we're going to find out that the guy who waves the plane in on the airport runway is also going to be conducting the ceremony. <laughs> you know, you, using those little paddles to push the bride into position. <laughs> <laughs> come, cut, stop, stop. stop. <laughs> hey, are you available for the wedding night? I feel like you could be useful to just wave us into the spots, right? I've had sex with a lady. <laughs> There's also this great moment here where she tries to blow the co-pilot a kiss, but the pilot stops her. Like he dives between the co-pilot and the kiss she's blowing him <laughs> because that would be inappropriate. It's so weird because the tone shifts so much. He's like laughing and joking. He's like, yeah, yeah. And then he's like, stop blowing him a kiss on my plane, you goddamn dirty whore. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm the pilot. I'm going to be yeah. enjoying this one. I guess, yeah, right, right. Hey. Man, you like switched a bunch of switches and you moved the throttle. You you can't commit to physical bits like this. We're not doing sketch comedy. <laughs> relax. Oh, you got there's a rope around you. You got mm. roped. You got lassoed. Don't don't do that. So okay. So now it's try time for them to serve lunch aboard the uh, the plane. <laughs> We're 15 minutes in. This is just plane admin. Why is That's he included? Why is he included? <laughs> right. No, I wrote my notes. I'm like, we're 12 minutes in and the closest we've come to a plot point is serving lunch. Now, I feel like they cut a good chunk where it was just like pretzel, pretzel, <laughs> pretzel, pretzel, yeah. pretzel. L little warm pretzel. cloth. Do you want a little warm cloth? <laughs> minutes? So now they didn't have those fancy flip down trays back in 1961. No, no, not at all. They had the little... The little tables that we used to have um, microwave dinners on when I was a kid, when you wanted to watch TV, right? The little... But they've got so much leg room. They have a lot of leg room. I kind of want to go back to that 100%. He's absolutely right. This is the perfect era it's of flying. huge. So much space. Oh, yeah. Also, I just want to circle back to this pilot situation really quick because they mentioned something crazy. The main pilot guy is like... Uh, let me let me warn you, uh, toots, about this guy you're marrying. He's a co-pilot. He doesn't make any money. Are they not both pilots? I feel like they're just both pilots. Right. Yeah. Because they don't study for co-pilot school. No. <laughs> <laughs> they're just a second pilot so that they can take turns piloting, I assume, in case one of them is... Because the thing is, otherwise, why would you have a co-pilot if not to be a full-fledged pilot should the first pilot become incapacitated. So, ah, uh, no, this, this plane's going to have to crash because we only had a, a core pilot on board. <laughs> right, yeah, right. no, he only turns left and goes up. Like, could somebody go in the tannoy and say, is there a pilot on the flight? I just read the gauges. Is anybody a pilot in the back? You're not a pilot? <laughs> Do we have somebody who can go? <laughs> That'd be like having co-doctors and one of them doesn't know all the medicine because he's just yeah, like right. a lower level. Like, oh, he's a D student doctor. You get to be a co-doctor. That's terrifying. But this movie clearly seems to think that there's like a para-pilot kind of a thing, a relationship that's going on here. Between, and, then, and I guess they think that the navigator gets promoted to co-pilot if the pilot dies or something. I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. it's just a purely dead man's shoes situation. Yeah, it's like a really weird <laughs> hierarchy. Maybe because there, were, there weren't that many airplanes like operational at the time. So maybe there just weren't many opportunities to be a pilot. So they did you did have to wait till a different pilot died because they were so limited in number of uh, planes. <laughs> oh, okay. That's what it must be. Yeah. 
So, okay. So, yeah. So, we watched them serve lunch. We watched the flight attendant serve lunch for a little while. That's exciting. They didn't have um, cart technology in 1961 <laughs> either. So, they're just like bringing out individual trays one at a time. Yeah, but there's only 10 people or so on the flight. So, that's right. not going to take that anyway. They can just like that's reach fair. everybody. Yeah. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay. And then we cut over to Dr. Carl Morris and the guy next to him on the plane says, hey, do you mind if I smoke? And I'm like, they're serving lunch, you fucking jackass. <laughs> Gross. But yeah, he's like, uh, no, I, I don't care. And he's like, hey, weren't you in the paper? Can you say your name again in case the audience hasn't caught it yet? <laughs> right. And this is where we learn that he's the Oppenheimer analog, right? He's the guy who came up with the idea for the next nuclear or like the next bomb beyond nuclear, right? The the the, the I bomb. But I feel like Oppenheimer wasn't world famous until after the bomb went off, right? It wasn't like he could have got he couldn't get on a plane anywhere because everyone knew him. Like, was he that big a celebrity, Oppenheimer? Beforehand? <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. I'll have to wait until Nolan's movie. People taking selfies with him and shit. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, he's like, he's like, by the way, I am a big fan of that giant post-nuclear bomb that you're th that you're talking about. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> I think we should blow up more shit. The guy sat next, he's so cheery. And he's like, yeah, no, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to the nuclear war. You know, I think we've got a good team this year. I think uh, I think the fixes <laughs> are working out pretty well. I, I reckon we can, uh, we can go far. <laughs> You am become death, right? To right. The world. <laughs> Fucking YOLO, man. Totally. <laughs> and then we cut over to this other couple and they noticed that the famous Dr. Carl Morse is on the plane as well, right? This is, this is Walter and Helen. And Walter thinks he should tell Dr. Morris about his mysterious big idea that the scientific community keeps laughing at him for, Right. Yeah, okay. It sounded like they were setting up him as like a whistleblower yes. about something, right? And then like yeah. the government and his wife were gaslighting him and like trying to say he was crazy, but he's not. But then he is though. He is, no, he's though. just he's yeah. just crazy. Yeah. Uh-huh. And they also they introduced that the wife is blind. And I don't think the actor's blind. I think I think she's a sighted actor as best as I could tell. Mm -hmm. So it seems a weird addition in there. And I thought, what, they're really just setting up the dominoes here of the different characters we've got on board. And I thought, this is going to be some sort of really intricate, almost like a kind of an Agatha Christie murder on the Orient Express yeah. kind of thing where all of their different personalities come together to form the plot. And uh, no, 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 no. The fact that she's, uh, she can't see is not important. The fact that he's never, crazy is not that important. Never. Yeah. The cheery guy sitting next to Oppenheimer doesn't, matter. doesn't come doesn't up again, basically. Matter. No, I was sure the blind thing was at least going to be a metaphor for something. Or nope. what I first thought is exactly what you said. It was going to like hook into the plot somehow. Yeah. I think this actor was just like, I've made a choice. I'm blind. And they were like, all right. Well, that complicates yeah, okay. things. Why would, why, why are you doing that? Yeah. There are no small roles, just small actors. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Fine. And I have to point out a line too from her husband real quick. He goes, He's noticing Dr. Carl Morris and he's like, honey, Dr. Carl Morris is here. He looks just like his picture. <laughs> so now, first, first of all, that's what pictures do, right? That's just how that thing works. And secondly, yeah, that is what they are. he looks like his picture seems like an inconsiderate thing to say to a blind woman. I don't know if it is. It just <laughs> seems like, like, what reference are you really giving her there? I'm using vision now. Anybody else? <laughs> Everybody hands up if you're using vision. <laughs> honey, honey, hands down. <laughs> So, and then Helen's like, honey, you just need to calm down and stop worrying about your brilliant, mysterious idea. That's why we're taking this trip that we're both taking and would obviously know why we were both taking. Let me exposit about it a little bit. Jesus. Yeah. They weren't great at that. She says they're, they're going to Washington, D.C. to settle down close to the soil and to God. <sighs> See, it counts. Totally counts for the, uh, for the <laughs> main release here. So... Uh, he's like, yeah, it's fine. Dr. Carl Morris would probably laugh at me just like all the rest. But when it happens, they won't be laughing. Tee hee hee, blah, ha, ha, right? That's right, which I yeah. thought he was going to have, he's going to have had some sort of premonition or, you know, he's, he's psychic. He can, he can see the future, something like that. And that's why he's like, oh, there's a bad thing coming. But like, we'll find out, not to spoil too much. He, he wants the bad thing. Right. Is that when it happens, the bad thing that I would like to happen, but I have no influence over. So, <laughs> yeah, no, right. No, you're right. It's like, it's like the super villain who just has hints that he wants to give world governments about doing evil. Like, oh yeah, my evil plan is I'm going to like phone up the president and suggest he do a thing. And he's going to say no. And I'm going to be like, <laughs> yeah, no, right. okay. Okay. <laughs> it's outsourcing his evil ability a little bit. Yeah. 
the movie's just sitting here pump faking by accident at all these <laughs> different plots, but they don't even realize they're doing it. It really is. And then nothing. Yeah. No, right. We're still just serving fucking lunch. We, we cut back to Tom and Marsha right now. Tom is creepily staring at Marsha as she eats because she got served before him. And he has this great line. He turns to her, watches her eat for a solid six seconds and goes, hungry? <laughs> As if Heath was called upon to flirt. I also eat food when I'm hungry. You, you have to ask a question that has a positive answer. And you know, then at that point, yes, would be, yes, you're hungry. Because I can see. <laughs> I've seen. But like, of course she's hungry. That's why she, I thought, yeah, I bet this, this, this guy's also one of the men who see a woman sitting with headphones on. So they ask him to take the headphones off. So they can then ask him, what were you listening to when you had the headphones on? This is something yeah, Tom would definitely, yes, definitely right. do. God. Yeah. The worst. Headphones, eating, Book, yeah. shut the fuck up on an airplane. Right. That person <laughs> does not want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so so he flirts his way into the conversation. He asks if she, she it, he asks if she's married, but he does it in such a weird way. He says, so are you one of those married ladies that refuses to wear a ring? Yeah. You one of those feminists who won't wear the fucking ear tag? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> it was very much a kind of, tell me, are you owned or can I call dibs? Right, yeah. Which reminded me of something that someone once said to Dr. Alice, who's, uh, who's you know, co-host on Skeptics Okay, when she was doing an event with uh, Merseyside Skeptics, a guy came up to her and said, are you Mike's? And she's like, what? Are you Mike's? As in, as in Mike Partner? She said, no. He said, okay, are you anyone's? Oh, yikes. That was with <laughs> like a, an apostrophe S for possessive? Yeah, possessive, possessive Whoa, apostrophe on Jesus. a human being. I didn't even understand. Fuck. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was a that was a fun one. Am I wow. the plural of microphones? What are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Do you belong to a person called Mike or do you belong to somebody else? Amazing. Oh wow. Wild. Well, and Marsha for her part is like, hey, can we talk about something other than my vagina? Because I don't want to talk about that. And she and, and he's like, Oh, well, I thought that's what I thought marriage was what all the dames wanted to talk about, right? And she's like, oh, look, there's food back in my mouth. It's impossible for us to keep talking to each other. <laughs> and this is where, like, she, she basically has, says that, you know, she's against the social concept of marriage. Like, I assume she doesn't like to label things. She's mm -hmm, not enjoying mm -hmm. this conversation. Yeah. But then he offers her a drink and she's right back on board. And I thought, against social concept of marriage, doesn't like to label things. Alcohol gets her right back on board. <laughs> if after this he challenges her to a game where she gets way too competitive, I'm just going to assume she's Heath in a wig this entire time. Yeah, 100%. really. Okay. Really, yeah. That's accurate. <laughs> I have no defense. I was about to try to, like, I was about to, try to be like, I will argue back. I, what am I going to say? Nothing. No. Nothing. Okay, nothing. I do sound I like don't that. wear wigs. I don't wear wigs. That's all you call <laughs> So I don't have a mole there. Fuck, I do. So meanwhile, in the cockpit, they need to increase their altitude to avoid a storm. Now, you might think, Noah, why are you telling us such an inane detail? Are you just trying to emphasize how banal this movie is? No, that's the plot. That is the entire plot. Yeah. The entire plot of this movie is going to be they need to increase their altitude to avoid a storm. Okay? That's, that, that is the inciting fucking incident. <laughs> it is. It is. But then they go higher and it gets darker. So, like, they need to fly higher where night is, apparently. Yes, right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Did they used to think it got darker above the clouds? Is that what they thought would Have happen? Have you ever seen pictures of outer space? It. It's black. <laughs> Duh. Yeah, exactly. Marsh, come on. The closer you get to the firmament, the less light of... <laughs> <laughs> We're on the bottom of the the sun is on the other <laughs> flat. <laughs> Damn it. Fuck. So then we cut to Tom and Marsha in the lounge. Now, all of us have this because we have already mentioned it in the record, but in our notes at this point, this is where we first realized that this plane has a fucking lounge in the back. Yeah, there's a bar in the sky. That's amazing. That's so fucking cool. Yeah, no shit. I guess back then you, you probably couldn't get more than 18 people on a plane at a time or so. You had to do something with the space, I guess. Mm. Or maybe this is just some shit they made up for the movie. I don't know. But yeah, so they're back in the lounge having a drink. I don't know where they got the drink because there's no bartender, right? It's just the two of them. <laughs> it's just a, it's just an open bar. You, you just go back there and there's just bottles everywhere and you're yeah, like, Scott, you great. <laughs> <laughs> it's just what I was in the mood for. Oh, there's a Dave and Buster's even further back. Let's go play <laughs> Cruising USA. Let's, see, let's get super competitive about it. Yeah. So so they're sitting in the in the lounge and Tom's going like, boy, I tell you what, I sure wish I had someone to have sex with when I got to Washington, D.C. How about you? Do you wish that? <laughs> yeah, it's creepy. He is very creepy. But then Marcia says, you know, I know you're full of shit. You're no lobbyist. And he's like, oh, you caught me in my lie. His lie is that he's a lobbyist? <laughs> <laughs> 
Like, I don't, I, maybe lobbyists were held in higher regard in 1961, but that seems like a low ball law. <laughs> I'm actually an aide to Ted Cruz. I don't know if you've heard of him, but yeah. it's kind of a big deal. Because I, I thought he was trying to do like a low key, sort of slightly sleazy kind of lie in there, but like, I don't know why, because we'd find out that he's like a rocket engineer. Right. Which he sort of knows. But like, if he's lying because he doesn't want to admit to being a rocket engineer, is that because he thinks that's a bad job to be doing? Or is it because he thinks it's security clearance, essentially? Like, he has to, he can't blow his cover. Because if it's a security clearance thing, he blows his cover instantly at this point and immediately <laughs> is now, you know, presumably a target for a security issue. Right. Yeah. Oh, it's definitely meant to be the security clearance thing, right? That's his, like, cover story because he's a... A government contractor scientist guy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So I thought they were playing this like, you know, I like like there's, there's something about Mary. He's actually a pizza guy. He wanted to lie and pretend he had a cooler job. That's what I got out of it the whole time. And I'm like, I feel like missile designer is better no. than lobbyist. Though. Yeah, okay. no, he's trying to right. he's trying to be secure. And but then immediately he's like, check out this map of how we're gonna attack Iran. You want to see it? <laughs> slap, slap, slap. <laughs> Fucking idiot. <laughs> Yeah, but apparently she knows her fucking nuclear missile designer. She's like, no, I know Tom Endicott. You're a nuclear missile designer. I have your fucking rookie card. And she's like, and he's like, oh, wow, you have my rookie card. Weird. She's like, I'm a mathematician and therefore I do nuclear stuff, too. And he's like, right. No, that makes sense. That is what new what mathematicians do these days. Right. Right. But like she's a mathematician. But she can't figure out the topological riddle that is wearing a pearl necklace properly. Because the if you see it, it's just, <laughs> it seems to both be connected and not connected. I think it technically exists in the fourth dimension. Like she's technically wearing a pearl version of a Klein bottle then just like around and in her neck somehow. Fucking Calabio shape. It's, Marsha's notes descend into madness it, they here. Do. He's just and like, I, MC Asher pearls, what is happening? It's impossible. <laughs> so... And th this is also where we learn that, you know, she's a nuclear expert and Dr. Carl Morris is a nuclear expert and he's a missile expert. The Pentagon seems to be summoning all of their nuclear experts to Washington, D.C. all at the same time. Right. And they say she, she wonders, do you think you're going to the same meeting that we're going to? So, well, how many secret last minute <laughs> urgent meetings do you think the Pentagon <laughs> is having with nuclear rocket engineers? Yeah, right, right. And he goes, you know, she's like, oh, wow, it seems like they're bringing all of the nuclear experts together. And he goes, why does that bother you? And I'm like, why the fuck do you think it bothers her, dude? But, <laughs> but then she says in a line that only a man could write for her, oh, feminine nervousness, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> It's exact words in the movie. Oh, oh it's so weird. What, what a phrase. Amazing. What do they think masculine nervousness is? Because they clearly think that's a real thing. <laughs> oh, it's, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. That would be a great question to pose to him. So, okay. So, and then she goes, like, do you ever feel guilty about building weapons of mass destruction? And he goes, no. Uh, do you, what? Do you? <laughs> 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 That's the level of nuance we get in this movie about the the morals of this. Yeah, yeah. It's like, no, we're the good guys. What are you talking about? What are you, why would we're not even the commies? All right, you're America. Well, apparently, movies discovered act breaks sometime after 1961. But I have to interrupt somewhere, so so we might as well be here. But we'll be back in a minute with even more of the flight that disappeared. Hey, Heath, what do you got there? Oh, it's just my latest delivery from typical meal delivery service. Oh, is that one of those things where they just send you the meals so you don't have to do all the shopping yourself? That's right. No, all I have to do is unpack 37 tiny little individually wrapped ingredients, spend like half an hour chopping vegetables and prepping the pre-prepared meal, uh, another hour of cooking, and then boom, bing, bang, boom, food. Very convenient. Well, I, I see. But if you really wanted convenience, why not try Factor? What's Factor? And you are racking up the points while Eli's away, huh? Right? The strike when it's hot. Yeah. So, so Factor is America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit. So if you want to just get your food and get back out to enjoying your summer, they're your best choice. With Factor, you can skip trips to the grocery store and skip the chopping, prepping, and cleaning up, but still get the flavor and nutritional quality you need. Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes, so all you have to do is heat and enjoy. Okay. But what if I'm looking for calorie-conscious options for the summer? Are you? I could be. You don't know. 
Well, Factor has you covered there too. They have delicious dietitian approved calorie smart meals with around 550 calories per serving or less. They even have veggie and vegan options in case you're Eli. Okay, but won't the meals get boring? Actually, you can choose from 34 plus chef prepared dietitian approved weekly options featuring premium ingredients such as broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. Plus, you can round out your meal and replenish your snack supply with an assortment of 45 plus add ons, including breakfast items like apple cinnamon pancakes, bacon and cheddar egg bites, and a potato with bacon and egg skillet. All right, I'm sold. How do I sign up? Just head to factormeals.com slash awful50 and use the code awful50 to get 50% off your first box. That's code awful50 at factormeals.com slash awful50 to get 50% off your first box. All right, Noah, I'll do that and probably get it delivered before I'm done unpacking this box. Right? Did they, did they wrap each mushroom separately? Yep, separately. Did that with the grains of salt too. Really? Can you help me get it, get it started? <laughs> you have nails. Ah, <laughs> uh, this is your captain speaking. We've I'm here too. Yep. Yep, we've reached our cruising altitude of 35,000 feet and it looks like smooth sailing from here. We should be arriving. I want to tell Let me tell him. Do you, do you know where we're landing? I, it's not I'm not I, Dave said you have to let me talk sometimes. You, you can tell it. them you can tell them the gate at the end. Okay, fine, fine. So, so I'm sorry about this, folks. That was my co-pilot. I'm a real pilot. No, you're not. You failed pilot school. I, I uh, yeah, yes, I passed co-pilot school. Right, but that's like that. You're reading numbers from a gauge. That's nothing. I I usually get them right when I read them. Do, do you though? It has the word pilot in it. I feel as like it's as same. as I was saying. We will be arriving at Dulles Airport around 8.30 p.m. local time. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight. <clears throat> Sorry. Right. Yes. And now a word from my co-pilot. Thank you, other pilots. Same word. We're both pilots. We'll be arriving at gate. Gate B-14. Fuck you. Get off the mic. I hate you. You get off. Stop it. No. You're going to break it's it. My Let go. It's Let my turn. It's Let go of the mic. You, you Sorry. Let go of the mic. Let go Sorry. Uh, 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 that was my co-pilot and uh, no, no, co not, co-pilot not interrupting him. No, no, and now no, they're fighting no. over a toy microphone that's my plugged eye, into no. nothing. It's plugged into nothing. Right in my eye. That was gate B-14, by the way. And we're back for more of this shit. When we last left off, I was offering to pay this goddamn movie to have a plot. And we're going to rejoin the action in the cockpit where the plane, for some reason, refuses to level off. Right. <laughs> the pilot the pilot lets the like shitty co-pilot do one thing and then it immediately <laughs> goes wrong, which I enjoyed. He's like, all right. Fucking JV pilot, you can touch the joystick once. And <laughs> immediately the altimeter goes crazy. And like the music is uh, all weird, like a genie's appearing from a lamp. So something, something. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah 100%. In, in, in the magical universe is happening here. Theremin kicks back in. They're being duped up by aliens all the way. Because, yeah, when we do cut to this, it is the co pilot who's on the control. It seems like he's doing an awful lot of piloting for a co pilot there, Hank. I think you should really yeah. either pr promote him <laughs> right. or accept your role here. You're the co pilot, Hank. <laughs> You're the co pilot. At, at a certain point, yeah. Yeah. But he's like, he's like, but I said level it off. He's like, I did level it off. So the pilot tries. He can't get it to level off either. It keeps going up. I love it. He's like, let me do it. Fuck, same. Jesus. <laughs> I pressed the joystick too. Same. It's being married in a nutshell right there. So, so then, so, <laughs> so they have to make this awkward call to air traffic control where they're like, our plane is in a tractor beam of some sort, right? So we cut down to air traffic control. And apparently there's a guy who gets the call and then there's a guy who needs to know the information. And there's another guy whose job is to carry the little post-it note, the 12 fucking feet between the <laughs> He's two a people of them. Person. <laughs> <laughs> the guy gets the call. He writes something down on a little piece of paper, hands it to a dude who just basically like leans over and reaches out to the next guy. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Alan, what did you what did you say to him? I can't read what he wrote. We're right here. We're yeah. right next to each other. <laughs> and th this way, like, th there's a guy who walks in at this point. A guy called Gareth apparently walks in, and he stands so close to his boss that I think he's practically wearing his boss. He's that yeah. close. They're, they're really uncomfortably <laughs> close to one another for the office place. 
Yeah, yeah. And he, he asks Gareth, the, the big boss does after having read this note and, and, you know, gotten a very serious look at his face. He says to Gareth, he's like, hey, is it possible for like a plane to refuse to level off and to just keep going up? And he's like, are you asking me if planes can reverse crash? And he goes, yes, that is <laughs> what I'm asking. He's like, no, that's not that's fucking nonsense. <laughs> So they get on the radio with the pilot and, and they're like, are you still going up? Yeah. Okay. So here's what you want to do. Try to correct it. Mm. And the pilot's like, oh, cool. You, you mean go d so down? Have you totally. tried down? Have you tried down? No, let me, let me try down? down this. Oh, I haven't no, even thought It doesn't down. work. That's why I fucking, fucking called. <laughs> I did enjoy them speaking to him through the microphone, which is like one of those bendy tubes that you can that you can mm -hmm. uh, move around. It's not just like a microphone that can pick up from nearby. So you've got to bend it directly towards your mouth and shout down it. That was quite fun. <laughs> like, like I assume this is basically connected to a paper cup and then there's a string going up to the plane and a paper right, cup on the right, other end yeah. of that. Yeah. Absolutely. Looks like Eli's set up when we started podcasting. A lot. <laughs> yeah, right. No, yeah, no, the right. microphone's pointing towards his mouth, so it's not like Eli. Not exactly. Good point. Good point. This was a little bit more professional. All right. So yeah, he, and they, they they get they end the call. They go, do your best to control it. He's like, what does that even fucking mean? Hello, mm. hello. <laughs> so meanwhile, Walter, the guy with the big plan, realizes that this would be the exact right time to accost Doctor Carl Morris, and so he does. Right, he gets up, he wanders back there. He's like, Doctor Carl, I need to talk with you. It's very important. Let's talk in the lounge. And he's like, yeah, nobody's in there. Curiously, despite the <laughs> Jeez. so. They go back there. The nameless fiance flight attendant, she goes to the cockpit and they tell her, all right, so here's the thing. Something's wrong. We don't know how bad it is. Uh, don't tell the passengers, <laughs> even when they start passing out from lack of oxygen. And she goes, great. Yes, that is my job now. Tell them to fasten their seatbelts to help with the oxygen. <laughs> Don't, yes. don't yeah. mention gravity getting flipped because we're pretty sure that happened also. Just, <laughs> just say the seatbelt thing. By telling them to fasten the seatbelts, we mean can you go to them individually, slowly, one by one? And can we, the viewers, watch you do that individually, <laughs> one by one? Yes! Because like, otherwise you could be thinking, hang on a second, there might have been a passenger there that she didn't say fasten the seatbelt to and this is going to take me right out of the storyline. No, we need to see every single bit of it. She, we need to know that she was committed to that. God damn it. Yes. Hey, Joan, I'm going to stop you right there. I'm in the back row. We got it. We got it. We're all <laughs> right here. We're sharing. We're sharing food at like a family style dinner together on this plane. We're good. <laughs> so meanwhile, so we cut back into the lounge where Walter is yammering at Dr. Carl. Now, it turns out that Dr. Carl, this is where we learn that Dr. Carl has an idea for the next bomb beyond the H bomb, right? It's an even bigger, even worse bomb because that's what we were after in 1961, right? And Walter's like, I have this great idea that the scientific community has been laughing at. And we're like, oh, is he finally going to reveal it? He's like, what if we dropped bombs on the bad guys, like big <laughs> ones right now? Yeah, like really big ones, like a bigger, the bigger one than we had. Like his idea is, you know, America is a bunch of pussies. They need to build bigger bombs, you know? Yes. You know, a bomb that, but stay with me here, bigger. Bigger than that. Wow. Yes. Got it. Do you have like a drawing of that? Maybe just write down the word do, big actually, so I, I mean, don't forget. I've got a drawing of a regular size bomb, but I can bring it closer to you if you need to get what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a weird moment. So Dr. Carl Morris is like, dude, you're out of your mind. We're not just going to like blow up Russia right now preemptively for no, that's a, that's a bad idea. You're out of your mind. And then Walter He's like, that is ableist language. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> okay. Like, actually, Carl Morris is like, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, no, it's, it's good. That's, I know. that's a good point. So we shouldn't I'm, I'm, use ableist language. I agree with that. But also, like, come on, man. Like, you just said a war crime. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so then the flight attendant gets to the back to the lounge and she's like, hey, you got to go up and fasten your seatbelt. I'm literally telling every single individual person in this movie. And Dr. Carl Morris is like, oh, good. This gives me an out from this conversation. But then he sits back next to the, the guy who was smoking earlier and the guy goes, oh, no, turbulence right after I ate. That's going to get me indigestion. And he's like, can I go back to talking to the genocidal guy again? <laughs> so, this guy's making preemptive fart excuses is all I'm saying. <laughs> I love that the flight attendant is like, hey, guys in the lounge, no more um, scotch and apocalypse yelling because look, the, the sign has now been illuminated <laughs> yeah, for right. no doing. Yeah. Yeah. We have a sign for that, too. <laughs> 
So we cut back to Tom and Marsha very quickly so that Tom can go like, hey, it's it's weird that we've just been going up for the last half hour, isn't it? So like there should be a limit to how up we go, isn't it? Uh, shouldn't there? And then we cut away. We go back to the cockpit. Everybody's looking awfully sweaty, right? According to the altimeter, they're nearly 10 miles up. They're way over the ceiling of how high a propeller plane can fly in the first place. Yeah, this is, this is the kind of altitude that only a jet engine could achieve. How are they managing that? Yeah, that's what they're, they're doing here. <laughs> right. Yeah. Also, they look at the altimeter and then they're like, oh my God, it's going up. But like, you know, you've been going, you've been trying to stop yourself going up for the last 10 minutes. Yeah. So what did you think the altimeter was going to say? Right. It was obviously going to have gone up. You think it was going to loop back around or something and you would be on the ground again? Yeah, no, maybe that's it. You know, like if you fly east, you end up, if I east long enough, you'll end up in the west. Maybe it was hoping if we fly up long enough. Yeah, we'll, we'll end up down. in the we'll down. down. It's fine. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> the earth's round, so it's fine. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> You know how liberals and conservatives at the edges are like basically the same. Yeah, we're, we're doing that with horseshoe yeah, the, the theory, horse of theory of aerodynamics. Yeah, aviation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we we cut back to uh, air traffic control where everyone's taking this so very seriously that a lot of people are in the room and they're all standing up, right? Even the even the fucking secretary is standing at this point, standing room only. I, I do like that they do have the secretary lady. She is allowed to stand, as you say. She's allowed to stand, but she's only allowed to stand. Until they needed to do some typing and then she had to go type again. That's her, her entire right. contribution is it's stand there because there might be something we need emergency typed and I'm not pressing those keys myself. Damn it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, because clearly they were like, uh, Janet, could you come in here for a moment? And they just do it. Well, just stand there until we get a call. Yeah. Don't say anything. <laughs> right. Right. So then we, we cut back to the to the cockpit. Jack, the co-pilot, has passed out from the lack of oxygen. So they they bring him some coffee. Yes. Coffee sort to replenish yes. the uh, the O2. Yeah. yeah, it's heavily oxygenated <laughs> coffee. It's, it's got, yeah. You know, if you put O2 and butter in your coffee, you actually become uh, magical. Oh, yeah. well, <laughs> so, and then we, we cut back to the passengers. Walter has passed out now for the lack of oxygen. So Joan comes through with an oxygen bottle, but she's getting lightheaded too. So she starts taking a couple hits herself too. And is this where Tom explains to her that she should probably tell people to like what to expect and not to panic and stuff. And it's like, you're, you're literally mansplaining the flight attendant's entire job to her. Yes. I assume she's had some training that you <laughs> haven't had. You build rockets. You don't fly on rockets. Like nope. let her do her job, mate. Sit down. Sure. Yep. No, yeah, but, but 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 Tom is just you know in, he's endearingly mansplainy. Trust the screenwriter, yeah, yeah. So, but in the cockpit, they're talking about the same thing. They're right, like they're like, well, shit. Do we tell the passengers that they're in an uncontrolled reverse crash? <laughs> and if so, how? We don't even have words for this shit, right? <laughs> and this is when they look out and they and they notice that the engines quit working all together because there's no oxygen. There's not enough oxygen to sustain combustion that high. Right, because they're good. They they did the science on this one. They yeah. nailed the science. <laughs> yeah, but and that sets them up to be like, that's impossible. That would take a Christian movie to be happening. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, "Why it would take a miracle," and then he just stops, and then everyone stops, and they look directly at the camera, and eventually it all fades to black. It's so good. It took them too long to fade to black, so all of them are like. Miracle. <gasps> Isn't there someone else say like it goes like that would take a miracle to and then someone else goes, a miracle? And then it fades. Yes, someone yeah, does respond no, you're right, with the miracle. You're right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so. Like, wait a minute. It's it's like he's just had a plan that's so crazy it just might work. But that plan is call this a miracle. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, exactly. They all that's... jump up with their feet out to the side. Freeze frame. That doesn't work. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I wrote my notes. Oh my God, the plane's climbing all the way to heaven too, isn't it? Isn't it? That's what we're going to see. Oh, I really hope that's the case. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. That's what I was so uh, excited yeah. by. Yeah. So, okay. So, air traffic control boss gets a call. We, we cut back down to ATC and apparently an observatory has seen their, their plane in a telescope. They've lost contact with it, but they're now tracking it with fucking telescopes, I guess. Yes. <laughs> And they said, the observatory said, it's flying without engines. Yes. So the telescopes are so good, they could see that the propellers weren't moving at that distance, We're which is a lot. <laughs> yes. But they seem to very quickly just accept the, it's flying without engines, like way, way, way too quickly. Like, well, either it's flying without engines or 
they just lost the signal, so we can't track them anymore. But on balance of probability, it's probably the magic thing. It's probably is that they're still flying, but without it's, the It's engine. a 50-50. So it's at least, yeah, right, yeah. Uh-huh. So, yeah, so we watched the air traffic control boss and Gareth, the pilot guy, the expert or whatever, trying to figure out what the hell the plot even is. And the boss thinks that they're dead, thinks that the plane's crashed and they must be dead. But the pilot's not willing to give up on them, damn it. Maybe the plane can fly without engines for hours and hours and hours. (laughs) Hours and hours of flying directly up. No, it's fine. It's fine. They've still got this. Uh, uh, Hank's a good pilot. He can turn this around. He can absolutely turn this around. Exactly right. And the boss says, don't get me wrong. And this is an exact quote. I've never wanted to be so wrong in all my life. (laughs) <laughs> wow, no second takes are, I guess, on this. That's not how that sentence works. So, okay. So we go back to the plane. Now, apparently they've gotten everybody their own little oxygen bottle. They didn't have the whole fancy oxygen mask drops from the ceiling technology in 1961, right? Mm. And, and Marsha, everyone around Marsha needs oxygen, but she is still trying to smoke. Everyone's literally got an oxygen mask <laughs> to, her so face, to their face. Yes. And she's like, yeah. I think I need a couple of drawers before I do that. She's like, my cigarette won't light. Yeah. <laughs> I can't light my cigarette. Pass me that oxygen tank. I feel like <laughs> that will fix my lighting situation. <laughs> so crazy. But also, aren't they under the control of God now? Isn't that yeah. what the movie is telling? So God couldn't just like supply oxygen to the cabin <laughs> at this point? I, I wanted the scene where God just gets a bunch of dead asphyxiated passengers to heaven and he's like, oh, fuck, that's on me. I knew right. that he needed. I, I just, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, because he's like, oh, you're supposed to like punch holes in the box so they can breathe. <laughs> oh, no, that's where it went wrong. <laughs> So yeah, so Joan's passing out oxygen. She passes out from lack of oxygen, right? It feels important to to just say to the listeners at this point. You know, we've been we've been doing this show a bit today. This has been you know we're getting we're getting deep into the episode. The plot that we have here is that the plane is going up, and it's been doing that for at least twenty five minutes now of the plot being like, well, this plane seems to keep going up. Yep. And if they get to where, wherever they get to where they're going, you'd think, oh, that's going to be the thing. That's going to be the most, most thing of the movie. But no, because like the time they spend just slowly ascending cuts into the, any time they could spend at the destination. Yes. So do not expect a lot of time <laughs> with the resolution because we spent it all very slowly ascending. L- <laughs> like this movie was worried that if people went up too quickly, they'd get like the air bends. Right. Like yes. a bend. <laughs> like, oh no, you've got to ascend really slowly to let the pressure equalize. Oh, even in fiction. Yep. <laughs> even, even when God is doing it, that God yeah. is bringing, so right. God is up there being like, Ugh, how long before they get to our spot? It's right, we, yes. we have to go slow because of what? Heaven is so far away. I can't Jesus. zoop them. You're telling me I can't zoop them right now. I'm God. <laughs> I think he's reading them in like a fishing thing and he's worried about breaking the line. Is that no, you've got to take yeah, it slow. If you try and go too fast, <laughs> they'll they'll wriggle and then they'll break the line and escape. Right, yeah, right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's just a moment where the fiance flight attendant, she tries to get into the cockpit and she can't so she goes get Tom she's like I, I saw that you were good at mansplaining things um can you mansplain this door open and he's like I sure can <laughs> so he goes up to the door he, he like muscles his way in all three pilots are passed out he's like you know plane seems to be still fine though right it's still going up yeah uh, up is up is better than what do they even do what he's proved is pilots are necessary yeah this is a, <laughs> this is a controlled experiment here <laughs> <laughs> So he's like, you better warn the passengers what's going on. And I'm like, what is, I don't. Yeah. We, we, we don't know that. It would be nice if you warned the audience what was going on too. Absolutely. Can you let the passengers know what's going on? And also let me know what's going but on. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I, I, we cut back to Walter, right? Walter thinks that this is like, I don't know, the commies trying to come and take him down because of his brilliant nuke of the commies first idea. <laughs> right. He thinks this whole airplane is a setup. They're coming for him. So he says, I'm going to get away and runs back to the lounge. Which was very confusing to me. I was like, okay, what's he planning to do back there to foil the <laughs> Russians at the bar, I wonder. <laughs> yeah, and I right. couldn't tell if the movie thought he was a good guy at this moment or a bad guy. I still don't know now that I saw the whole thing. Not, yeah, the not movie really. does not know at all. I, I think the movie forgot he was in it. Like They got to the end and they're like, oh shit, we had that Walter guy we should have done something with. Ah, it's fine, <laughs> it's fine. Right, it's fine. Right. <laughs> He's D.B. Cooper in reality. <laughs> oh, they, oh, interesting. So yeah, so the, the fiance flight inst- attendant goes out to tell the passengers what's going on, but then she passes out from the lack of oxygen just as she's about to start. 
Luckily, she passes out right next to an open seat. So Tom like gently guides her down into that. Then Helen wakes up. Helen is the blind, Walter's wife, the blind wife. And she starts yelling, Walter, Walter, where are you? And we're all like, does she do that every time he pees? Like, I feel like she's got to be used to sometimes she wakes up and he's not there, right? She's, this is why we just wanted you to do a wreck. Okay. Oh, he is there, but he's very slightly further away than she was expecting. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, exactly. She- <laughs> he's crouched behind her. Somebody push her. Somebody push her. <laughs> oh, my God. So, yeah. So she's like, uh, Walter. And then Tom goes, oh, I'll mansplain. I can mansplain my way through this problem as well. I'll go find your husband. Don't worry, lady. Yeah, man. It's like a tiny little tube. Like, it's right, hey, like There's not, not a lot of places to hide. He's yeah, there's, right. there's two rooms and you're in one of them. Look yeah. around. He's not there. He's he's in the other one. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> or he's in the shitter. So And you were just in the cockpit, so you can even rule that out. Yeah. <laughs> So we go back to the back of the, the lounge where Walter is. Apparently, he's trying to open the emergency door. I just thought he was trying to punch his way through the fuselage. Oh, yeah. He 100% <laughs> spends a long time just punching the plane. And it's only when Tom gets there, he goes, like, oh, shit, doors. Yes. Right. That's how we get through. Because I assume he just saw Tom work the door to the cockpit. And Tom is the only one who inspires door opening knowledge in anybody in this film. Oh, right. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> So like, it's like Walter's like an NPC in a game, whereas if Tom hadn't have gone into that room, he'd just been punching forever, waiting for the interaction to start. Right, okay, all right. Just like glide walking <laughs> at that wall, not going anywhere. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, so, but he, he's like, what are you doing? And then Walter opens the door and leaps out of the plane. Mm. And Tom's like, oh, um, I best pull this curtain across. Lest well, I guess, be yeah, right. So, he does. <laughs> yeah. He does. He walks through. He's like, well, that's a whole fucking thing. He'll probably make me fill out a form. <laughs> Shit. No, we can't go to the bar. Yeah, um, right. right. <laughs> yeah, he's just hoping someone else discovers it. And then he's like, yeah. oh, that happened. Oh, that's crazy. What? Oh, I wonder if what happened now. <laughs> sure hope Walter wasn't in there. Yeah, right. So he just walks back. And by the way, though, like we should point out that nothing is getting like sucked out of the plane or anything. It's having no effect on the on the atmosphere within the airplane, having the store open. Mm. So he walks back out. He he goes to his seat and he passes out too. Now everyone on the plane is unconscious. So meanwhile, back at air traffic control, they're all chain smoking. They just really are emphasizing just how cigarette filled every goddamn phase of life was in 1961 with this film, right? And the- they're putting their cigarettes out on the office floor of air traffic control. They're just yeah. dropping them and standing them on the office floor. Like, who are these animals? <laughs> right? Yeah. So and we watched them because they had figured out earlier that the with the reserve fuel, the plane could stay in the air until 1230 p.m. Right. So we watched them watching the clock as it ticks around to 1230. I wrote my notes. We watched them watch a clock in the movie. Yes, we do. <laughs> we actually do. With multiple cuts. Yes. Yep. <laughs> But 1230 comes around, they, they, they still haven't heard anything, so now the plane would have to be out of fuel, and everyone must be dead. And this is where the air traffic controller says to one of the guys, okay, okay, you know, the dead, get back to your other traffic now. And I wanted the guys to be like, okay, I will. Oh, shit, five planes have crashed in the time we were looking oh, for yeah, this one. Right. Oh, so, <laughs> oh, like, man. Two of them crashed into each other, like that stupid plot line from Breaking Bad, it's really bad out there. <laughs> Okay, you know what? From now on, we should not all crowd around this one little area. It's like a shitty it's podcaster bad. set up a mic here, but we all have jobs. We all my, have jobs. My bad. This is a, there's a lot of other airplanes. Yeah, right. And they're like, well, I guess we should probably tell the news. And I'm like, tell the news what? That your plane reverse crashed? This was LA to DC, right? It's not like it was going over the ocean. If your plane crashed, you'd know about it. I think what you do is you tell them that the passengers rose up and uh, all the power of the hijackers and now they're all heroes. I think, <laughs> I think that's what you do with mystery plane Not crashes. Not you too, Mark. <laughs> that was just for Heath. That was just for Heath. Let's roll. <laughs> Liars shot down. <laughs> all right. And so we get a news montage, right? Well, and I, I wrote news montage, but it's one newspaper and then one newscaster. They were like, we're not going to mm. do a whole fucking, you get it. You get <laughs> the newscaster it. is reading from A4 pieces of paper and he's like looking his notes the whole time, just like yes. reading verbatim from his notes. Like, wow, old timey news was great. It was so yeah. good. <laughs> it just has a weird like pin in map of the United States behind him for no fucking reason. He's like, yeah, so the airplane went down. Dr. Carl Morris was on board. Also, Tom Endicott was there. What, the Carl Morris? Not the Carl Morris. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) And then, like, it was a writer in this actor's fucking contract. They're like, also, Tom Endicott, major character. He was on the plane as well. 
right? <laughs> and introducing Marsha as the mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> So she dives across the frame. <laughs> Everybody cheers, though, the home studio audience. Or, I'm sorry, the studio audience. Yeah, I'm saying, oh, my God. She said her tagline. She said it's Marsha. Ah. Classic. So meanwhile, so so we cut back now again to the air traffic controller guy fucking smoke pacing. He's like, it's been four hours. They think that would mean 830 a.m. I don't know how they got there. It's it's they would be 430. Anyway, so they, they didn't have a mathematician on set. Just somebody who played one, I guess. <laughs> But he's chatting to the air traffic control pilot guy and he's like, he goes, you know, I got to fly to Washington to coordinate the search, the air search. I'm like, yeah, they'd never figure it out without you, man. Is, is this why he says, and he transitions between two conversations, but can't get the volume right? So he's like, well, the thing is, they've got to be somewhere. Yeah. Just, <laughs> so <laughs> aggressive. Right. And I assume it's because he's talking, he's shouting, because the guy he's now talking to has earphones in. He's like, quick, pull the earphones out and ask him what he's listening to. Come on, that's what you need <laughs> yeah. to do. Come on, come on. <laughs> Well, that guy is an air traffic controller controlling air traffic. I want him to be like, hey, man, real quick, uh, just a note for you. Don't aggressively startle me while I'm working here at air traffic control. You're slapping the instrument panel. Stop. Stop. You get why that's bad, too? You get it? Five planes crashed earlier when we had that meeting. So. And then we cut back to the fucking newscaster to fill us in on the nine seconds that happened since the last time we saw him. And he goes, he talks about like, he's like, every airplane in the country was put into action, flying back and forth, up and down, all over the air to look for, I don't know, fucking clues or whatever. It's like, so stupid. I don't think that's the how they did it. Chris, it quote, crisscrossed the country from every direction, yes. which seems excessive and wildly inefficient because the plane flew from LA to Washington. It's like, okay, we need to crisscross the country from every direction. So you start a plane in Seattle and like right. fly it to Alaska and see if you find anything. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think we can rule that direction out. Well, yeah, right. We have 360 planes from Seattle and then we'll just start moving stuff. Yeah. Right. Hey, what boss, what fuck? angle should we do that at? 90, 90, guys. What are you, are you serious? <laughs> What do you do, a bunch of rhombi all over the place? That's insane. Well, you have to do every height, too. Come on, guys. It's three dimensions here. So, all right. Well, we it looks like we've got a full-ass plot going on at this point. So, we're going to pause to soak that in for a minute. But first, let me give Act 3 the hard sell. Will the pending nuptials between the co-pilot and flight attendant ever factor into the plot? Will the painstakingly emphasized fact that this is a prop plane rather than a jet ever matter? Will the dude with the blind wife advance the story in any meaningful way? No. Just no. All three nope. questions, no. <laughs> nope. But stick around anyway for the almost wholly unrelated conclusion of The Flight That Disappeared. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Hey, Noah, why is the ad copy blank on this third ad? Oh, crap. Sorry, guys. I meant to have something written, but with Eli on vacation, friends coming to stay this week, all the work that they're still doing on my kitchen, Tom being off from Citation Needed, and you know, all the Pat Robertson funeral parties I've been invited to. I've just, I've been having trouble keeping up. Sounds to me like you're spending all your time on other people and not enough time on yourself. Oh, this is the ad copy. And right. if you're starting to feel like you're stretched too thin, therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind. I don't know, Heath. I live in South Georgia and it's virtually impossible to find a therapist here who isn't actually an undercover religious operative trying to abuse their profession to push me towards Jesus. Well, maybe you should try BetterHelp. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Wow, that sounds great. How do I sign up? Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash awful today to get 10% off your first month. That's better help. H E L P dot com slash awful. Awesome. I'll check that out and try to get this work life balance thing sorted out. Great, great. Because you did promise to write me an article for the skeptic, and it's been a while oh, since you made that promise. Yeah, sorry about that. Also, you promised to change my oil. I didn't promise that. You said it in the ad. It's canon now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually change your oil. You'll regret it. All right, gentlemen, this is an emergency. So I'm going to get straight to it. As of 4.30 p.m. Eastern time, we've lost all contact with Flight 60. Its last check-in was at 35,000 feet, approximately 40 miles east of Denver, Colorado. Then it simply disappeared. Oh, dear. <gasps> How tragic. 
Yeah. So we have no choice but to mobilize the largest aerial search party ever seen. We need to get every airplane in the entire country crisscrossing the nation immediately. Sorry, we need to what? Make a big airplane grid to search. So a, a net to to look for Flight 60? Look for Flight 60, exactly. Oh, so we're looking for the missing airplane in the air? Well, yeah, that's where it was last seen, isn't it? The air. So, I, I'm sorry, so that's not how lost planes work. Yeah, also not what? how looking for things works. Of course it is. What are you talking about? With all due respect, sir, I think you're underestimating how big this guy actually is. I am not doing that at all. That's why I intend to equip each plane with binoculars. I didn't mention that. I don't think that's going to be enough. It would it would literally be more effective just to ask everyone in the country to look up at like 706 or something. Ooh, you think that would work? Should we do that? No, no, I don't. I don't think. Damn it. Every minute we're arguing about this is another minute we're not finding Flight 60. Right, but compared to your way of not finding it, arguing is just really fuel efficient. Damn it, we're doing the airplane grid thing that I came up with. I have the biggest desk. The final say, that's what we're doing. Fine. But it's stupid. You're stupid. Hey, uh, after this, guys, do you want to go and smoke cigarettes like right next to a baby? We, we sure do. Yeah. Bully. In an elevator. <laughs> <laughs> We're back for still more of this shit. And we're going to rejoin the action with Tom waking up on the plane. Everybody else is still passed out, right? Okay. At this moment, I was really hoping the whole thing would end up being a prank by the KGB to fuck with these like American <laughs> <laughs> nuclear rocket scientists and everything. No, nothing like that. Oh, or they really were after Walter. He fucked it all up by getting out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel bad that Tom woke up first because he went to sleep last. So he's, he's not going to feel rested at all. No, that's fair. You're right. Mm. You're right. <laughs> So he wakes Marsha up. He shakes her. He's like, Marsha, wake up. She wakes up and she realizes that the plane isn't moving at all. She goes, have we landed? And I'm like, there's a window next to you. It isn't dark <laughs> out, right? We can see the light coming from the window. Have you landed? <laughs> Very answerable question. Yeah, yeah. right. But it, so instead of looking out the window, they head to the lounge to look for clues. Well, they, they don't even head to the lounge. They just stand in the aisle like the plane just landed and got to the jetway and everybody's like forgot that there were people in front of them again. You know? <laughs> yeah. And Tom's just naming dumb shit. He's like, everybody's dead. Or you know what? Could be a uh, torpor. Right. Yeah. Yes. Could be you know hibernating. It could be that they're hibernating like <laughs> bears. Now that I think about it, there's a lot of options. And Marsha's like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Can we get to the plot? What are you saying? It's insane. It's insane because he does that just by, he, he doesn't examine them. No. He just has a visual glance at them and sur surmises, oh, they're not dead or unconscious or asleep. He specifically says, he says, yeah, they're in a state of torpor and sus suspended animation like hibernating bears. What? And it's like, can you tell all that just by looking at them? Because I don't think any of them have like developed a fecal plug like a hibernating bear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You make missiles. Maybe it's like a quantum superposition thing. Right. And they're like up, spin, down. They're not here. They are here. We don't know. Jesus. Dude, what are you saying? Check someone's pulse. Just check right. their pulse. Yes, check their breathing. Thank you. Well, so and this is where they check their watches and realize that both of their watches stopped at exactly 6 p.m. So it's good to know that God's punctual with his yeah. like, hijackings. <laughs> he also, they says, well, I, like he says he doesn't feel dead. I was like, okay, but like, Walter's definitely dead for what that's worth. I mean, let's just use that right. as a baseline. Oh, yes. Like, exactly. we can start with that one and work from there. Yeah, right. We're, how are dead are you compared to Walter? <laughs> <laughs> On a scale of one to Walter. Yeah. So they they checked the watches and like they both stopped at exactly six p.m. So that's supposed to be a clue here. And then Marsha immediately checks her heart and she's like, "Oh, my uh, my heart also stopped." But she doesn't check. She just she just intuits. She's like, "Oh, it." I don't have a heartbeat. It's like, can you just do that? Can people just stop and be like, um, well, yeah, no she heartbeat. says it and then puts her hand on her chest and she's like, yeah. yep, yep. No heart. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then she's like, check yours too. And Tom's like, oh, I also don't have a heartbeat. And I'm like, I feel like you would check two or three places to make sure, right? Like they just put their hands like sort of in the center of their chest and they go, nope, no beat. Yeah. She just cuts her neck open. Okay. Blood stopped. <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> Yeah, he's wearing a three-piece suit and he's just putting his hand on top of that. Yes, so, okay. Right. I mean, there's a, oh. there's a, you've probably got a vest underneath there as well. It was basically <laughs> just the 50s recently. You were wearing a vest at the same time underneath. <laughs> so, 
So, and then Tom's like, you know what? Let me check the cockpit and see if there are any clues. They were like, there's an open door in the fucking lounge. But no, he goes to the, <laughs> goes to the fucking cockpit. The pilots are all still passed out. So, and again, keeping in mind that he doesn't know for sure if they've landed, he just starts yanking around their joysticks a little bit to see if that does anything. <laughs> it's the best. Oh, hundred percent. He, he plays with the steering wheel. Like it's one of those ride on airplanes. You get outside of a stall. Like he's a child. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, he goes up there and he's like, bum, 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 "That's a truck." No, no, still go. nothing. No, that's close. <laughs> what do they do up here? So yeah. <laughs> so, but then just then, Marcia notices that Doctor Morris and Walter are missing, and Tom's like, "I wouldn't be super worried about Walter." <laughs> Per se, but Dr. Morris, no, that, that's a genuine mystery. Let's check and see if he's in the lounge, right? He is. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> they go back to the lounge. Dr. Morris, because he's a named character, he's allowed back there. Yeah. Right. He's chilling and he's just sitting by the open door and we can see that they've, they've put like a smoke machine right next to him. And this actor is clearly like he's got fucking tuberculosis or some <laughs> weird shit or something like that. And this smoke is really bothering him and he really doesn't want to sit there, but he has to stay there until they come into the scene. Oh, there, there is so much asbestos in that smoke. <laughs> this, is the, this is the 60. That, that smoke is pure asbestos. Dust. <laughs> hey, bud, you, you taking a shot of thalidomide for no reason? <laughs> yeah, that's I weird. don't understand. That's weird. What are you doing? You're just sitting by the, the open airplane door. And Dr. Morris is apparently back there figuring out how the the science of <laughs> physics stopped working and gravity's not there and mm. time isn't there. And he's just like doing math in his head about that. Yeah. Uh -huh. and it, this is where they ask him what he thinks. And he says, well, you know, I'm just speculating. Like, but you're not speculating because you're not saying anything. If you're going to speculate, no. say some stuff. That's what speculation is. Would you like to share your speculations with the whole class? <laughs> if you don't share your speculations, that's thinking, mate. You're right, just yeah, thinking. you're just... Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah and so th this is where they all realize, because so now we've got the mathematician, the missile guy, and the bomb guy, right? So they, they realized that they were all being called to the Pentagon to make this super, what they were calling the beta bomb that Dr. Morris had come up with, right? That's what they, that's where they were they were headed. And they have to explain now, Marsha and Dr. Morris, they have to explain what that is to Tom. Mm. And they're like, imagine a bomb like where a single bomb could destroy a whole country. <laughs> and I'm like, well, those vary in size by quite a bit. Are we, like are we like, are we talking Canada or Andorra here, right? Like what what when you say country, what are you thinking? <laughs> right? Right. And the idea is that they're all realizing like, oh, if you take our different, you know, math and science stuff and put it together, we could maybe blow up the entire world. Do you guys think that's relevant to us being like floated up by probably God right now? Yeah, because I think and we're like, Dr. Morris, he's got the really big bomb. And uh, Tom, he's got the really powerful rocket. And Marsha can work out how many big bombs you'll need for how many rockets because she's mad. But like, yeah, once you built the bomb and you built the rocket, I don't think you need the maths anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right, one of those and one of those. That's two. Done. Right. Yeah. Guys, do you think we am become death? Sorry. <laughs> I had, you know, I had, you know, come on, Bob. Come on, Bob. You knew you were getting made fun of for that one more time. <laughs> Idiot. And, and, and just then, as they're talking about making this great big bomb that could destroy an entire country, a mysterious man from the clouds like materializes to interrupt their conversation. Yeah, by materializes, he walks through the asbestos. Well, clouds, he walks like, through the, yeah, exactly. Wa waves it out <laughs> to the weather. <laughs> 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 right, this, this actor is called Mr. Legionnaire. It's where Legionnaire disease came from. Oh, interesting. It, just, it was this asbestos. <laughs> All right, no, that makes sense. <laughs> so yeah, so, and, 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 so this guy has... I. I honestly, I don't know whether it's a British accent or just a theatrical accent that he's going for. I don't know, but his... his it's a mesothelioma accent also. <laughs> <It's> a <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but but he's like, you are in a place where time doesn't exist. And I'm like, I feel like it'd be harder to have a conversation if you were, though, because there's... Okay, doesn't he say you're at the place where the future and the present meet? Yes, he does. Which... I, I don't know physics that well. That's the present. I that feel is like the that's present. The yes, present. that is the present. We call that time the present. Yes. We call that now-ishness, right? Because where the past meets the future is the present. Is no, the that, exact that moment is the of exact, that point. Yeah, that is that. Is that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. So, and, and he said, he's like, he's like, we're in a place where time doesn't have any meaning, where the future and the present meet. And we're just like, well, obviously time doesn't have any meaning or that'd be a stupid fucking sentence. <laughs> right there. <laughs> 
And also when he says, you know, you're, you're in a place, you know, where the, the future and the present can meet, Marsha says, so that's why our watches stop. That's an mm, interesting use of so there. I don't yeah, right, think that right. consequence <laughs> flows from that concept. And, and uh, Dr. Morris goes, has this ever happened before? And I wanted the guy to go like, before I just fucking told you the time doesn't exist. What are you talking about? It doesn't even make sense to me. He's like, no, it's never been necessary but until now. And I'm like, oh, there's a now in the place where time doesn't exist. <laughs> but what a weird question to prioritize. Right. You're in a place where time has stopped. Okay. Has this happened before? You're not going to ask why? You're not going right. to lead with why. Or how? <laughs> even how? I would understand how, but no. He goes... So are we like, is that, how special are we? It's just like, uh, once every, yeah. Are we your first? We're your first, aren't we? Okay. okay. <laughs> right. So this guy, this, uh, the hovering ghost man that they're talking to uh -huh. is kind of like a Jesus character, right? Something sure, like that. Yeah. God, uh -huh. Jesus. Something. Yeah. Yeah. And he's saying like, all right, you idiots were going to cause the apocalypse. So I had to do an intervention here. That's what's happening. Yes. To be clear though, <laughs> like, Jesus is mad because they were going to upstage him right, and yes. not let him do his apocalypse <laughs> revelation. Right. I have a whole sword mouth thing that I've been working on. I've been mm. doing the choreography for years on this. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and this is where we get the line because of the fact that we're going to cause the, the apocalypse. They've, they've brought them here and it says to be judged by a jury of all the people who will never be born because of you, which I think technically is the new abortion policy in Texas. I think that's what we just brought in. <laughs> Oh, I was like, okay, please, please be a jury of fetuses that they do, right, in like yeah. little Krang suits or something that they get tried yeah, by. They, <laughs> I felt, I, I just wrote my notes like that doesn't feel like a very impartial jury at all. I feel like the deck is stacked here. But this is also we, where we have to explain the big mystery of Marsha, right? Because she goes, yes, nuclear holocaust, exactly why I don't want to get married and have kids. And they're like, oh, that explains why a lady wasn't obsessed with marriage. Now it all makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's Heath's reason, too. He's worried about nuclear winter, you know. <laughs> yep. So it's just socially responsible <laughs> to not love. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I have love. Yep, you sure, <laughs> you sure do, he. Thank you. You do, buddy. We yeah. have, you don't need no fancy love from there. We have love at home, don't we? So, <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so the guy, the, the, the Jesus character, he beckons them to come with him, right? They're like, he's like, he's like, come this way. So they walk through heaven, very foggy there, so foggy that you can't really see. Is that a painting or is that actually just fading into the distance? Really, it's unclear, you know. There's lots of big rocks here, like big plastic rocks. They've mm -hmm. walked onto a disused Star Trek set. Like Star Trek, later Gene Roddenberry would come across this set and be like, bingo, have right, I got yeah. some plans? Now yeah. That, yeah. But this is like a heavenly place-ish, right? Mm -hmm. And we mm. hear the, we kind of know that because of the harp trill that's happening. Oh yeah, there's a full on harp solo going on. But it keeps going for way too long over and over. And I just felt bad for like the angel that had to deal with this. Just being like, come on, I can play so many different things. You just want blah, 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 over and over and really? <laughs> well, but also like there's a harp solo, but there's still a theremin underneath it. So it's like an angel and an alien were in a fight over who gets this movie, right? Who this <laughs> counts for. <laughs> But I, I think that fight did happen, but in the writer's room, because this film does not know whether these are angels yes. or aliens. And I assume that's because there was an angel and an alien in the writer's room pitching hard <laughs> that it should be their thing. And just right, like, they, yeah. there was just a magnanimous third party. Like, okay, it's both. It's both. Would you just shut the fuck right. up? It's both of you guys. Enough ambiguity and anything's applied. <laughs> like a harp theremin duel for a minute. It was a big thing. Right, yeah. yeah. So he's like, uh, the Jesus guy's like, oh, these are the accused and the jury all walks out, right? Yeah, they suddenly appear like they're about to, like like Tom is about to watch a private performance of Lord of the Dance because they're just in a big <laughs> long line slowly <laughs> fading into view. Right. <laughs> the harp is just playing away. <laughs> Very high waist lines in heaven. Okay, and so they're doing like a minority report thing, right? Like yeah. on, this is a, a trial for future crime of these three people who like, thought of something but didn't do it yet. Yes. yes. And I'm just thinking to myself like, all right, I mean, I get what you're going for here, but God, he ignored a bunch of fucking ski balls over the years, like several. <laughs> yeah. Very recently. This is 1961, <laughs> y'all. Right. Just look back a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. You don't want to stop any of that? Yeah. Nothing? 
Nothing spring to your mind? Did, did that tractor beam not reach all the way to Germany or Austria? Was it, is, it, is it just an American tractor beam? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Flash? So it's got to be facing heaven. It depends on which way the earth rotates at that moment, <laughs> apparently. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and, and he's like, you know, but we, Tom's like, we've committed no crime. And he's like, no thought, thought crimes, but we were the, we're the good guys, by the way, but thought crimes. <laughs> like, oh. And then fucking Dr. Morris says, what is this place? And I'm like, come on, man. It's fucking, it's heaven or something vague like that, right? Nope, but it's not because apparently the guy says, this is not a place. And like, are you sure? Because it seems to have a lot of place-like qualities around it. <laughs> kind of looks like a place. Yeah. Well, so just like time doesn't have any meaning and time and space are really just different aspects of the same thing and therefore mm. nothing has any fucking meaning. Yeah. Yeah, that, that rock over there, it doesn't have any meaning. It's just, no, it's just, it's, just, it's not really there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, if time doesn't have any meaning, you're doing a trial about a future crime we did, so that's nothing, right? Right, what are you talking yeah, about? yeah. He's like, you know, he's like, we're from the future, and they're like, he's like, are you? He's like, well, not really. No, hold, hear me out. We are theoretically, we could be from the future, mm. except that you destroy everybody with your bomb, so we don't get to, we don't get to be future people. But, but no, they don't. Like, they, so... Jesus guy shows them like a little video of like, look at the future you made where, you know, they blew up the earth and they show a bunch of the earth. Mm -hmm. If they can see the future up there, they know that the verdict of this trial is whatever it is. And they know that they just showed a lie about the future, don't they? <laughs> well, but time has no meaning there, Heath. So they don't know about before or after. Oh, right. No, <laughs> counter argument. <laughs> Shh, shut yeah. up. <laughs> right. It is great when they show them the video though, because that look at what you will do. See how the devastation has to absolutely count as a war crime. And now let's not think too closely about the case for Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Just right, 15 yes, years before this film happens. Showing you footage of, right, the Americans don't go to the Hague. It's That's not where the Americans go. <laughs> come on, come on. They're also, and this is such a minor point, but I have to point it out. He's like, and notice in the video, you don't hear any birds. And we're like, we don't hear wind, man. There's just no hmm. audio with that video. He's like, That's because there's no atmosphere. Hmm. I mean, yes, like, but I saw I saw an atmosphere. You can see that. You don't. You guys yeah. don't know that's a visible <laughs> thing. I also I, I really like when it's like no birds fly, and then Doctor Carl's like, why, why? It's like, come on, man, you're a nuclear right. physicist. You can probably figure out what happened here. <laughs> he goes, imagine a child was set loose with a match in a gunpowder factory, and I'm like, now you sound like Eli fucking pitch and citation needed sketches or something. Come on, <laughs> calm down. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, it's like, could anyone predict the extent of that explosion? It's like, first of all, weirdly specific analogy about the child in the factory. But mm -hmm, secondly, mm -hmm. could they predict it? Yes, yep. absolutely. That's that's literally one of the physicists you're talking to could do that. That is their job. With enough with enough information, they could do that. That's Marsha's exact fucking job, man. It's just what she does. McMahon's plane. Yeah, exactly. And also, thirdly, like, do they still manufacture gunpowder in factories? Because if they do, I'd like to think they had some like safety precautions in place. And if a kid did drop a match uh, and, and the factory went up, I think that will be on the factory owner for not putting sufficient. You've got a gunpowder <laughs> right, factory. No, you've you've got to make it flame proof. <laughs> you don't blame the kid. Gunpowder yeah. factory 101. <laughs> did you employ a child and let him bring matches? <laughs> So what? So Tom would like to speak in his defense, it, like, it, and, and he's like, "But you guys keep talking about what we will do. We haven't done it yet. I feel like you have to wait until we've destroyed the world mm. before you can punish us." And they're like, did, "Did you hear it? Did you hear it just now when you <laughs> yeah. fucking said it?" I think you should just punish us after we wipe out all life on Earth and yeah. eradicate <laughs> you specifically from existence. I think that's the time that we should really be looked at for our actions, right? But now that we're here, let's talk about God who made atoms that spray out insane explodey poison if you split them. <laughs> I just realized that. I didn't do that. <laughs> well, but there's really a, a weird, like, it's all Oppenheimer's fault if you think about it moment here, right? Where they're like, but we're just the people that had the idea. Like, you know, it's the people who actually build the bombs and decide to make them and decide to deploy them that should be blamed. And they're like, no. No, it's science's fault for knowing things. If you hadn't known <laughs> shit, this never would have happened. I wanted Marsha to just put up her hand and be like, yeah, I just did like calculus for a second. I'm going to take off because this is obviously not, <laughs> yeah, not me. Come on. Everybody's doing calculus. If it helps, they didn't respect me or let me in on literally any of the secrets. Right. Half the time yes, I had to yeah. make the coffee. So I think I'm good here. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm a black woman in reality. <laughs> 
So the jury with, withdraws to consider the evidence. Now, the evidence that they've been presented is just the Jesus guy yelling about how guilty they are. So it doesn't feel, seem like a very fair trial. And quick, quick thing about the withdrawal of the jury. For, for starters, in the future, you only get 10 people to a jury, not 12. Interesting wrinkle. Wonder when that came in jurisprudentially. When was that kind of uh, introduced? But when they withdraw, they withdraw into teams of five. And I thought, well, what if, what if they come back with different jurors? Oh, right. Versions? Yeah. No, interesting. Or, or do they have to like change the teams around, like do si do, and there's like a sort of swing your partner around? <laughs> Uh, one other note on the jury, it's uh, it's all white people. Oh, he says like these are people from all over the world and we pan over them. Every single one of them is white. A little mm, more diversity yeah. mm -hmm. on the world jury. Yeah, that would have been great. <laughs> so, yeah. So while the jury, he asks, he's like, hey, so what's the punishment? You know, like if we if we get found guilty here and he goes, you're going to be stuck in this cloudy non-time, non-space place for the rest of time. And Tom has this like, eternity with Marcia doesn't sound so bad kind of a look <laughs> on his face. <laughs> he does, but but he says, you know, if you're guilty, you'll remain here. And Tom says, well, by here, you mean not a here, you know, because this isn't a here, is it? It's like, all right, man, you know what he meant. <laughs> like, don't be a dick about this. I'd just like to see how this plan came about in the first place. <laughs> Hey, God, uh, you uh, you wanted to see me? Hey, Gabriel. Yeah, come on in. So here's the thing. We need to stop the atomic bomb right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's 1961. Kind of kind of late on that, right? I, I mean, OK, I mean, like a big we have to stop the, a bigger one from happening. Oh, OK, I guess. Uh, so so what's the plan? Yeah. So I need you to bring in the inventor guy, take him to an atemporal vortex that I'm going to create. And then what we'll do so is... I'm, I'm sorry, wait, we'll, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. You can manipulate the time dimension? Yes, I can manipulate the time dimension. I can do anything. I'm God. So just go back and, and like, make atoms differently. Ah, that's... Everybody says that. It's like a whole thing. What's done is done. We're moving but past. No, no, because you can manipulate time. It's literally not it done, is though. It is what it is. It is what it is. I said it is what it is. I'm doing, like, a spackle-style deity thing. I just, like, fix things as we go. So anyway... Go bring in the inventor guy. I feel like it's not just one guy. Right? It's going to be like chemists and physicists and mathematicians. Fine, and fine, thing. fine. I'll get like a rocket guy and uh, a math lady. A math lady? Really? I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. That just doesn't sound like you. Yeah, no, I know. No, I'm trying to bump up the diversity, equity, inclusion score. It's like cancel culture. Am I right? I got to like That's get a better not score for that. You know, I, I would move past it. So, 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 what happens with those three people? Yeah, so we put them on trial for their future crimes, and I already got a jury ready to go. Take a look. There's a jury. Do you, oh, you want to maybe get a few people of color in there? No. Oh, okay. It's none of their business. Right. Okay. Got it. And is this where Marsha? She says, oh, we're going to be stuck in a fourth dimensional nightmare. And I thought, is it fourth dimensional? Because it's it's outside of time and space. Is that like, is that not north dimensional? Like right, none of the yes, dimensions it's are. Zero are <laughs> dimensional. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and, and while the jury's out trying to decide their fate, Tom's like, don't worry, guys. I am, you know, a fucking genius missile nuclear engineer guy. I have a plan mm. for how we can get out of this. And they're like, really, what's what should your plan? we do? What, what were you thinking? We should run away. Mm. What? Like you know how you know here? I do know here. We should go elsewhere. Like not okay. Here. But we're in the always nothing, never always already. I, that's not. You, that's nothing. What you're <laughs> Aren't you a fucking rocket scientist, man? It's, it's great. The future guy can see the future, knows exactly what's going to happen, but didn't foresee leg it as an option. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> also, a good point. Yeah. <laughs> So the jury returns. They're like, you're guilty. And Tom's like, now. And they run. And the future dude is just like, dude, I just fucking said distance doesn't matter. And time is. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> so dumb. So fucking dumb. So so they hustle back towards the plane. They figure if they can get to the plane, they're going to be fine. But the plane disappears as they get close to it. 
And I really hope that the plane had been taken to a fifth dimension higher by a different set of future people who had a different beef. Like they were, like they were <laughs> upset at the seating plan at the core pilot at the flight attendant's wedding. Like, uh, you committed a crime in the future. You asked people if they were vegetarian and then you served the meat eaters fish. But like some of them liked it, but some of them weren't really into the fish. And if, if it had, if it had been known it was fish and not like a meat, they'd have said vegetarian and they'd gone for the vegetarian option, but you made them have fish. <laughs> So they stand there arguing about where the plane is. Is it left? Is it right? Eventually, future Jesus ghost dude walks up and he's like, guys, come the fuck on. You can't run away from the magical vortex of space timelessness, idiots. What are you doing? It's just it's like a Pac-Man board. You just end up back over here anyway. We only have so much set that we can blow smoke over. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. But then correct me if I'm wrong. God shows up to be like in an awkward fight between him and Jesus, like a like a messy fight between the two of them about the philosophy. <laughs> oh, that's God. All right. I thought I just wanted the jewelry. It's an older ghost man. And it I'm is. just figuring like it's Jesus and dad. Uh, okay. All right. So like, again, the movie is super, super vague about whether these are fucking ghosts or whether these mm. are unborn fetuses or whether this is God or whatever. But yeah, cause what we see is just some random. He's like, you know, I now hereby condemn you to spend. And then some other rando old guy comes up and says, no, that is no longer the plot. You know, we're not doing future crime stuff. And then the Jesus guy is like, God damn, I was doing future crime <laughs> stuff. It makes sense. OK, this makes this makes a bit more sense, because I thought what had happened here was the, the future, the guy from the future with his 10 jury members had come all this way, had convicted this guy. And then one of the jury members had gone over and gone, actually, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't. And he's like, yeah, yeah, OK, fair. Yeah, no, we, we, we <laughs> I, I feel we could have had this argument before we left. Right. Like, if you, you didn't want to do the future crime thing, you could have said that before we traveled back <laughs> in time. <laughs> if you were just going to get here and go like, don't do it. Like we could have saved an entire journey. It would have been, it, it would have been much easier. Yeah. Seems like that would have been enough. It's such a weird fight. And it just ends with the old God guy being like, nope, shut up, shut up. Time stuff makes movies dumb. We're dead. Zoop back to the present. That's done. His argument is he says, how can the future presume to judge the present? And I'm like, that's how the future works. That's where the knowledge of the present is, man. Every judgment is the future judging a present. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a a lot of essentially what judging is. That is is an inherent part of the judging process. Is looking back and saying, is that good or bad? In or- if you pre-zoom, the future is the perfect thing to deal with that pre-thing. Just think, <laughs> think it right. through. So yeah, so but the but the smoke machine fills everything in, and then we cut to the flight attendant waking Tom up with smelling salts because yes, it was all a dream. <laughs> <laughs> this about me so much. I was like, don't fucking tell me they did the like the the, the primary school cop out at the end of a story that you can't be asked to finish, and you just wake up and it's all a dream, and that's what this movie is. But it is. It was all a dream. Well, sort of. We'll we'll get there, mm. right? Or is it? Is it? Is it? Well, so so Tom apparently has never heard of dreams, is unfamiliar with the concept of dreams, because when <laughs> he wakes up and everything is not how it was when he, you know, last fell asleep, he turns to Marsh and he's like, tell him about the fucking God jury trial thing that they did about our super bomb. And she's like, fucking what? Oh, yeah. It's like when a toddler has has had a dream and they think it's real and they start t- t- trying to interact with you in it. But it's Tom, the hero of this movie, has the <laughs> intellectual capacity, the hero of this movie and a literal rocket scientist had the intellectual capacity of a toddler. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because he he goes to Marsha and she says nothing. And then he he looks back at Dr. Morris and he's like, Dr. Morris, tell everybody about the fucking time vortex. <laughs> Dr. Morris just tries to hide by not moving. (laughs) And he says nothing. And he doesn't move for like five seconds. And that works on Tom. Mm. Tom's like, fuck, he's gone. Uh, All right. (laughs) My vision's based on movement. Yeah. I gotta gotta convince people somehow. Well, and then he's like, no, you guys remember when the plane kept going up and we all had to take oxygen and everyone on the plane is like, no. And he's like, I can prove it. Um, Blind lady, your husband's dead. And she goes, fucking what, man? <laughs> yeah. 
Walter's not in the chair at that moment. Uh-huh. So that that's what <laughs> that's what Tom is trying to base this on. And then immediately after he's like, but Walter's missing. <laughs> Walter walks down the aisle. He's like, nope, just taking a shit. What are you I talking swear, about? So what's going on? <laughs> so- and and it, it very much feels like the movie's going, and Walter, who did not die, was <laughs> exactly Right, right, yeah, 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 exactly. Very Dry your eyes. Muppet's Christmas Carol. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> So, yeah, so they're they're like, so, sir, you need to sit down and, like, stop all this crazy ranting bullshit or whatever. So he does. But then Dr. Carl starts thinking about it. And he's like, you know, maybe this isn't so crazy after all. So he goes to Tom. He says, Tom, I need to talk to you and Marsha back in the lounge. And they're like, isn't the plane landing? And he's like, it does apparently doesn't fucking matter in this universe. (laughs) Uh, We also we check in with the cockpit real quick, just so everybody knows that they're still cocking pits or wherever the fuck that word comes from. So then we we cut back to him in the lounge. <laughs> that is a weird word, isn't it? Yeah. But this is where we learn that apparently Marsha and Carl do remember Tom's dream. So she was just gaslighting him when, she, when would, he said, "Do you remember that? it?" And she's like, well, "I don't know. This guy's <laughs> exactly. fucking crazy." Am yeah, I right? Right. <laughs> so, well, but the thing is, too, is that they explain that Tom bumped his head. They're like, "Oh, you took a pretty nasty bump on the head." Well. What, did Marsha and Dr. fucking Carl also take bumps on the head? No, it's just Tom's bump was really bad. Like, it, was, <laughs> it was a very bad bump on the head. <laughs> yeah, it bumped so hard, the whole team went unconscious. Yeah, so. <laughs> and then I guess, like, Dr. Carl says, okay, so there's only one logical scientific explanation for this. ESP. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? Okay. Extra, they what were they saying? All three of them were sensing the same perception of a a vortex of nothingness, everythingness. Well, I think that I think what he was arguing is that Tom was having a dream that was so intense that their ESP picked up on it, yes, and that they were seeing his dream. Because and he says, he's like, Well, come on, we know scientifically that ESP is a thing, right? Let's definitely, (laughs) there's no question really about that. So, you guys ever see Pacific Rim? You remember the drifting (laughs) thing? (laughs) How would that even work if there wasn't? It's like in the drift. Read a book. (laughs) And he said, like, you know, perhaps one day we might be able to explain ESP. Is that "Ah, don't hold your breath, mate? You will, you will not like how we explain (laughs) ESP in the future. (laughs) Right, right. It is not going to excite you. Well, and, and and Tom's like, okay, all right, well, but I think we actually did get sucked into a time vortex. He's like, that's just silly. You sound silly now. Do you hear yourself? Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Morris says, well, what's your scientific explanation? It's like, says the doctor who was literally just saying it was ESP. Right, yes. You don't get to throw storms here. And Tom goes, all right, so like, even if it was just like a super powerful simultaneous ESP dream, maybe we shouldn't build like, Canada destroying bombs anyway. And Dr. Carl's like, well, now you're just talking crazy. <laughs> I really want them to come to the conclusion that the only way to stop the nuclear holocaust is for the three of them to hurl themselves out the door like Walter did. Oh, and that'd be the end of the film. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't too late to save it. So, okay. And so then we cut back to the cockpit. They like call into the tower to tell them that they're landing. We cut back to Transco HQ and realize that, hold on a second, Something is amiss here. It wasn't all a dream. Flight 60 actually did disappear. Yeah. It's like, oh, so it wasn't a dream. It really happened. The spirits did it all in one night. That's, yeah, that's what right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so air, air traffic controllers are like, oh, wait a minute. Are you telling me that it's like for real Z's flight 60? So we see a, a couple of guys run up in trench coats. I, I wrote in them in my notes. It's like, oh, a couple of detectives are here, but that's just how people dressed in 1961, I guess. It is, <laughs> but they all walk shoulder to shoulder. So I think there are a couple of guys in a trench coat. I think oh, it's just one wide <laughs> trench coat that they're all in. All right. Because they stand shoulder the show the entire time. You're right, they do. <laughs> so, so yeah, so they're like, okay, so we should let him land. Seems like the least we should do and then we'll sort it out from there, right? They argue about that for a second though. They do. It was like, oh, we're going to mm. let him land, boss? And it like, <laughs> was there talk of shooting him down? <laughs> <laughs> they were heroes. Shoot right. him down, tell him we'll give a hero. <laughs> I should not encourage you. Marsh is on no. board. That's canon. <laughs> yeah, yep. So yeah, Marsh did nine eleven with Kara. <laughs> so we we have this weird moment where like this weird editing fuck up where they're like, "Yep, the planes landed," and then they all look outside, watch the plane land, and then we watch the plane land. It's really bad. They figured out fucking editing continuity sometime after nineteen sixty one. Anyway, eventually the company bigwigs run out to meet everybody on the runway. 
all of this is so unnecessary. They string this bit out for so long. We get it. They were really missing. And now they're not missing. It really happened. But this is like 10 minutes of them going like, hold on a second. Where did this plane come from? This plane disappeared. We're sure this plane, is it the right plane? Is it really a plane? Can we touch it? Is it real? Lick it, lick it. Does it taste of yeah. metal? So, just <laughs> right. get on with it. <laughs> right. And so so now Hank, the pilot, is the first guy. Because when, when they call back up, they're like, hey, we weren't expecting to hear from you. And he's like, why the fuck weren't you expecting to hear from me? So he goes out first and, to find out what the fuck's going on. And the the bosses are all standing out there, like the president of the airline that he works for is standing there when he comes out. And they have this really like weirdly coy conversation where they're trying to get him to admit <laughs> that he's been gone for the last 24 hours. Like it's a gotcha. Right. Like yeah. they're trying to sort of trick him into, a, into admitting something. Right. Like they'd ask the right question and he'd be like, wrinkle in time. It was a wrinkle in yeah, time. We did really, a wrinkle yeah, in time. Exactly. <laughs> they go, you got so uh, anything unusual happen along the way? And he goes, what are you talking about? And they're like, yeah. oh, fuck, he's a good one. <laughs> it's very much the energy of like you're a teenager and you've had a party and you've cleaned up by, by the time your parents get back. And your parents are like, so uh, did you do anything while we were out? And it's like, oh, fuck, does she know? Does she, I can't right, tell she yeah. knows Oh, God, do I admit it or not? <laughs> Just tell us about what happened. No questions asked if you tell the truth. I am. What? Normal speed of my answer now but the pilot and the bosses are arguing about whether or not it's tomorrow just as carl marcia and tom are getting off the plane right and so they're like ah the dream did represent a wrinkle in time type thing even though they said time didn't matter but a full 24 hours passed and wait what were all the other people doing it's just yeah the mm. qu questions about it. but they realized that that was really the future reaching out to them and telling them not to build that bomb yeah oh no which which means they're going to build a bomb which means that the world is destroyed which means there's nothing we can do about this oh my god it's all going to go to shit no wait 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 he's going to rip a page out of his notebook it's fine it's fine oh. so he'll, he'll drop one <laughs> single piece of paper in a bin and the entire crisis is averted the tension it's can so be stupid. entirely punctuated with a, a mild bit of, uh, yeah. of litter collecting that's it the three of them walk away and and one of them says to, to dr carl like Okay, well, are you convinced? And he's like, yeah, yeah, no, totally. That was a wrinkle in time. God, I will tear up this one like post-it note worth of math from this tiny notebook yeah. to save the world because now the nuclear math is over. There's no more. Yeah. So, actually, actually, here's, here's the thing I can do just to make this extra secure. I'm going to turn that one in the equation into a seven. That's fine. That's right. fine. No so, one can no, no, never... it. find it. <laughs> well, so, and keep in mind now, in this movie, first of all, we've got Crazy Walter who's running around like saying how he wants to pre-nuke the Russians. He's there, mm -hmm. right? He could see Carl throw away this notebook, which Carl's made very clear has the plans for how to build a world-destroying bomb on it. Right. The fucking guy sat next to Carl was the one who was like cheerleading the nuclear war and sat next to Carl the entire time. He's also one of the 10 people getting off the plane and could have seen that as well. <laughs> right. And also, Dr. Carl is so famous for his idea for a world destroying bomb that he can't get on a fucking plane without half of the people recognizing him. Right. <laughs> so like clearly like other countries probably have people watching him. They see him go like, oh, it's too dangerous and throw a notebook into a trash can. I feel like they're going into that trash can. Mm. Right. Yeah. So all kinds of ways that this guy, like he didn't set it on fire even. <laughs> he didn't even fold it in half. So at least you'd have to pick it out of the bin to read it. <laughs> right. <laughs> wait, wait, I can keep my math. What if you tear up a page of your missile notebook and I yeah, keep all my math? That. that would work too, wouldn't it? I feel like uh, rock, paper, scissors. So, and that's the end. That's the movie. And he's like, oh, I tore up my notebook. And they're like, well, in the future, it'll be just fine. Then I guess we'll only have hydrogen bombs. We'll stop at a, <laughs> at a reasonable amount of explosives. <laughs> All right. But I want to end on a personal question because this got to me, th me to thinking last night. So imagine that theoretical future alien gods kidnap the flight that you're on so that everybody else will pass out and they can condemn you for some future action that you haven't yet committed. Oh. What are you on trial for? Okay. I uh, probably I'm like the John Connor of the Oxford comma wars. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I probably killed a lot of people. All right. All right. That would have been my guess. <laughs> yeah. We live in a society. <laughs> I think they're going to come back in time to try me for inventing time travel. 
Uh, I think I'm going to be the one to do it. I think they're going to recognize that and come back in time to stop it. Not because they're against time travel, but just because they want to set up one of those paradoxes. Right, yeah. Because that no, proves like, really lucrative <laughs> to the Terminator franchise. So there's a lot of money in a good paradox that they want to set up. Well, I get it. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that's going to do it for our review of The Flight That Disappeared. That's not going to do it for the episode just yet, though, because we still need to like get caught in the same fucking web next week. So tell us, Heath, what's on deck? We're going to be watching Come Out in Jesus' Name. Oh! And I believe that is a Greg Locke documentary of some sort. Let me just say on behalf of my inbox... It's about damn time, right? We just did, we did just did in Jesus's name. And a lot of people thought, oh, sorry, in Jesus name. And a lot of people thought that's what we were going to do. So I'm very excited about that. So with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 409 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Marsh for hanging out with us today. And a reminder to check the show notes for links to his other show and check the show notes to get your tickets for QED. They are still available. It's the best conference in skepticism and it's happening. Marsh, when's it happening? Ooh. They they absolutely are still available. Absolutely. So yeah, it's the 23rd and 24th of September in Manchester in the same venue we always have, the Mercure Piccadilly. There's loads of really interesting speakers. You've got uh, Joe Ondrak, who's uh, an open source investigator who looks at things like the QAnon movement. We've got Debbie Ging, who looks at radicalization into the incel movement. We've got Dr. Alice Howarth from Skeptics with a K, who's my co-host on there and a fantastic uh, fantastic skeptic and stuff. We, it's just going to be a really, really good. And we've got Dan from Knowledge fight who's gonna be talking yes. all about his work tracking uh, alex jones it's gonna be a, a huge huge amount of fun it always is great so you should all definitely definitely come qedcon.org i am more excited about the qed main stage speakers this year than i have been in a while and that's saying a lot because you guys always put on a hell of a show so oh, it's, it's a really fun lineup yeah for sure yeah, be sure to check the show notes for more information on that. Also, I have to throw out a huge thanks to all the Patreon donors to help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist, Citation Aided, D&D Minus, and The Skeptic Ride, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Tim Robertson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slot and Google Dress on Mars. All the other music was written and performed by our audio engineer Morgan Clark and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a check of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick, I'm Delicious. Promise to work harder or another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with a Breakfast Club close. Nobody else ever wrote equals bomb QED like Carl Morris did on that little piece of paper <laughs> and nuclear weapons are gone now. That's nice. The plane arrived 24 hours late. And everyone on board almost died, but it was still a better experience than flying Ryanair. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I still have an injury from that. <laughs> the future would go on to wonder if saving humanity had been the right move. <laughs> I love you trying to force the R's in. It's just, it cracks me up. I'm leaving mine out for the sake of the accent, but I love, I love listening to you. For, it's yeah. so good. Yeah. You still, you have an old timey Jonathan Jerry going. Now you have like a, a, a 60s Jonathan Jerry. It's the best. <clears throat> All right. Interstitial 2. <laughs> I and, like that you went with American aggressively drunk. I feel like yeah, that was, so, yeah, that was <laughs> that, it's the only type. It's the only type. <laughs> You live too okay. close to I'm Ireland not going to be American to say that. I've got to stop okay. doing American. I can't keep it. <laughs> Mark's just like, my face hurts. I don't know what you guys do. How do you do. guys it's do like, this? It's like I've been playing trumpet for an hour. I can't <laughs> handle all this innate confidence. I'm not made for it. I've got to, I've got to go back to a mousy Britishness. American embouchure or something. It's weird. All right. And interstitial three. The crisscross flights. I just really want them all to start crashing because the air traffic controller is paying attention yeah, right. to this one <laughs> flight. And they, they've set the flights off to literally crisscross at 90 degrees. <laughs> every, plane, every plane just keeps hitting another plane. It's just, it's, <laughs> <laughs> we should have designed a different lattice. Did we not oh, space God, them? You had to we stagger. The ones going st left have to stagger with the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2023. All rights reserved.